this book is how anyone can be sucked into that. You know, here here's the gymnastics that sure. I went through. It wasn't a, a, a character flaw. It was, you know, how someone can get sucked into a, a cult, an abusive relationship, and, and stay. I, uh, I'm glad we're talking after, like, a little while after I read the book, because it took me a while to, like, process it. Yes. Was it hard for you to write? Was it traumatic to write? Or was it cathartic? It was cathartic, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, it felt great. And and I mean you had a, you had a good amount you had a good amount of separation between the events of the book and then writing about it. Yes, definitely. Did you have to wait? Was there were you like because uh, my generation of American employees and the reason I think there haven't been more books is there were all sorts of legal paperwork that everyone had to sign, and mm -hmm. I wondered if things were a little sloppier at the beginning, which I assume they were. Yeah, yeah, I think that they were for sure. Um, there was, when I was even just selling this book, um, there was a lot of talk, you know, what did you sign? Yeah, yeah. And in my memory, I, I really held on to everything. Anything I had signed, really? uh, I still had my severance agreement, I had everything. Uh, but there was really nothing that was too, uh, the severance agreement was pretty standard. Um, but yeah, a lot of agents and stuff were a little flipped out. Yeah, but yeah. surprisingly, going through that legal read, there was very little uh, little stuff I had to change. Yeah, I... um. I just thought the book was perfect, especially the beginning, because you, you're what at Union Station or something, right? I forget where you were, but you're you're you get you get handed a piece of paper that's basically a flyer for a cult, and you're like, no, I would never do such a thing. Yeah. Yes, I'm and at the then, Glendale Galleria, yes. a very important landmark in Los Angeles. You know, that's and... where the first Apple Store was. Oh no way! Yeah. Oh, I know that Apple Store. That's yeah. my Apple Store. There you go. Oh, that's so crazy. Yeah. Um. Yes, I I was. Um, confronted by this cult girl who just looked like a regular college girl. She sure. had a Northridge t-shirt and um, she told me she had a prophecy for me, which sort of piqued my interest. And then she said, it's about the mother God. You know, do you know the mother God? And right there I was like, oh no, I'm in California. Here's here's my first cult experience. I've been here a week. Sure. Um, it was very obvious. Um, and then later, you know, when I was scouted for American Apparel, it was... Um, you know, just as just as um, explosive of a pitch, yes. but way more appealing to me. Right, one appeals to the ego, the other sort of spiritual, and then the other, is, one is uh, a job and uh, exciting and interesting and all these things mm -hmm. that sort of get your defenses down, but then mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, it has a similar dynamic, I feel like. Oh, definitely. Do you, do you uh, like, did you come to see it that way after that you had sort of been in some kind of a cult? Or is it cult-ish? Have you heard that word? It's like cult-ish. Yes, like not... that wonderful book by Amanda Montel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, exactly. Um, if you would have told me then you're in a cult, I would yeah. have said, this is my job. I'm yeah, getting a course. paycheck. Never, ever would I. Um, but there were certain dynamics about it that were culty. Yeah. I mean, even then, uh, that felt good. You know, yeah. everyone's looking for a sense of place and purpose and identity, especially when you're 23. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Charney really harnessed that. He, you know, created this neverland of young, ambitious people that were still children in a sense and um, very easy to uh, manipulate. And you, I was one of them. Oh, yeah, me too. I yeah. mean, my, my first visit to the factory... I, I saw him first at his house. I, I I met him there and at the little house or the big no, the house? big one, yeah, the, uh, which we should talk about. But um, which was a you know a surreal experience. It was mm -hmm. at night. You're looking down at LA for, from this like you know multi million dollar mansion. I'd never met anyone like that. But I remember he said something like, "I want to show you the factory. Come down, you know, like in a couple of days." And I went down to the factory, which is in uh, the warehouse district of downtown Los Angeles. You drive through Skid Row, you know, you have no idea what to expect. And then you pull up this enormous building, which still, when I was there, still had the same banners that you're talking about in the book, "American Apparel is an Industrial Revolution." Those banners are still on the building. Really, it's very unusual. What are they doing up there? It's probably hard to take that. I mean, it's two. They were two of the biggest buildings I'd ever seen in my life. I mean, there it's. 800,000, two 800,000 square foot buildings. Mm -hmm. And they've been there for a hundred years or something. And you, and I, so I, I walk in, you take that janky elevator up you're talking about. And then I, <laughs> I was supposed to meet him on one of the floors and I meet him, he's sort of on the move. 
And he he walks, we walk through this cafeteria, which I'm sure it was the same one. And then all of a sudden you're just on the floor of a factory where mm -hmm. like these sewing machines are going and people are, I don't think I'd ever been in one before. You know, people are making these shirts at this like lightning pace. Mm -hmm. And as he's walking down the thing, everyone stops and they get up and they just start cheering. cheering. And I was like, what is this? You know, this that, that wasn't the cult in the sense that these were, you know, young, but these were like uh, factory workers who had been so changed by the decisions that he'd made. Like they owed this, this guy was their ticket to the American dream in an incredible way. And I remember seeing that and just, I mean, I was just sort of in it then, yeah, you know? That's the moment I had that exact same experience. They were getting up on their chairs. And now that I think about it, does that happen every day? You know, I don't know. I did never, he ask for that I, in some did, way? I, yeah. How? Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. You know, did he? But, you know, uh, and I'm sure you feel this way, too. But, um, you know, when people look back in hindsight, you know, how could you stay? How mm. could you have stayed? That moment sure. is all you need to firm your resolve that this is a good place. This is a place that's making a difference. And I want to be a part of this. Yeah, I mean, when you think about these cults, right, the, a cult is sort of promising all these things that potentially in the future this could happen. This is this path to acquisition. All these sort of ephemeral spiritual promises, right? Mm -hmm. Which, depending on who you are and what you're going for, that could be very attractive. I think what was very different about American Apparel is that shit was real. That was a real building with, with making millions of garments, making hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And there were real people who were not like the people that I grew up mm -hmm. with who were like, this guy is doing a thing that shouldn't be possible and is life changing and amazing. And you're just like, I want to be a part of that. Absolutely. And I still believe in that business model. You know, it's very complicated. It I is. It's it incredibly can be done. complicated. It can be done somewhat seemingly easily. We desperately need those factory jobs back here. Mm -hmm. Can we do it? Let's do it. When he was, I know it's not that simple. But. He was doing it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's not like yes. he had this sort of promise. It's not even like a WeWork thing where you're like, this is this. It, it's an it's a revolution theoretically. Like it was mm -hmm. real. It was happening. It was making stuff, and this stuff was good. And I thought I would work there for the rest of my life. Did you? I don't know if I thought I'd work there the rest of my life. So my relationship with American Apparel, I think fundamentally why the cult never like got me mm -hmm. is that I always wanted to be a writer. And so, and I met Dove through Robert Greene, uh, who wrote The 40 Dollars Power, we talked about in the book. And so I always kind of had one foot in and one foot out mm -hmm. in that like, I really want to do this thing and it was really exciting and I thought I could learn all this stuff. And I also thought it would be a way to make money and then be secure. Mm -hmm. So, but, but I always had this other thing that I was doing. And I think fundamentally what Colts do and partly what made, made the American Apparel dynamic work is he was really picking people who didn't have anything else going on or any mm -hmm. other options. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes your world. And then as you get isolated from regular people and the rest of the world, your sense of what's normal and not normal goes away. Absolutely. Yes, exactly. That's the story of striptease. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, and, you, you know, you don't, when you're 23, you don't see yourself as a child. Oh, no. I but had you it were all a child. figured out. I had it all figured out. No one was going to get me. But yeah, you are brands. You are wet behind the ears. I met Dove before I could legally drink. And so I mean, that's crazy. How old were you? Were you 21? I was I turned 21 like a month after I started. Oh my gosh, that's so crazy. I was 23, so I was almost on the old lady side. Like I was one of the <laughs> elders there. Yeah. And it, when I left, I was 27 or 28 and then I certainly was. Right. Yeah, but but you don't like in when you're 20 or 23 or whatever, you're like, I'm great. I'm I have all these things. Up. You don't think mm -hmm. like I don't know shit. Right. Yeah. And so you you can't even you can't even go. Why does an adult want to hire me? Like, mm -hmm. why? Why do they want this? Right. Yes, and the yes. reason they want it is because you're a child and you don't know shit. Yes, right. Like, yes. <laughs> you know, people will say, well, why didn't you rebel? Yeah. Why? I thought I was rebelling. We were in this subversive company that was changing. We sure. were rebelling. We were revolting. Like that, I was doing all of those things that I thought 
the kind of person that I I was would do at 23. Right. Yeah. You don't you don't see him as the man, and you don't no. you see the everyone else working regular jobs, doing regular things. They're the man, which is kind of the dynamic of what a cult does or any tribal dynamic, which is like, mm -hmm. how do you make it us versus them? So then yeah. you don't think about what's weird about you. You only think what's wrong with them, and yes. then as the media attention or the outside criticism comes in, it has the very insidious effect of actually making you dig in deeper oh, to absolutely. the thing. absolutely. Any friends that I had, what are you doing working there? I, it just, uh, you don't know. It 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 um it solidified my my feelings. I was in the right place. Um, it just pushed me deeper and deeper and deeper in. When you, you talk about this in the book, it's like you think you're you're winning and no part of you is like, you're making like, Twelve dollars an hour. <laughs> you know what I mean. This is you're not winning. Like this isn't. You have no sense of how it works anywhere else. That's why you were picked, mm -hmm. and so like you're you don't see your, you you can't see yourself as a victim, mm -hmm. and so you're missing the fact that even if this was like you're not even like being mercenary because you're not being paid enough to be mercenary. You know, <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. I know it's so shocking. It's so shocking. Um, yeah, it's a uh, it's it's weird. There's not that many people who can talk about it because well, that's why I was so looking forward to our yeah. conversation because no one really knows. And yes. I, I was like, what is this going to be like? Because he really knows. And I mean, I was there during the party. Yeah, and you were there during the fall. Well, yeah, you were there. It's weird, right? Like I felt like I was there early because it had just gone public. But yeah, I mean, even when you were there, it was. I mean, he'd been doing it, in, for people who don't know the American Apparel story, he started in his dorm room at, at Choate, the like the elite boarding school on the West mm -hmm. Coast. Mm -hmm. And so he'd been in that business for 20 years yep. or, or 15 years. And then I didn't come along until like years after you. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of had these different eras. Yeah, it did. But... Um, yeah, when I started, I mean, there were people there with far more seniority than I. I was the new girl. Yeah. But um, really, I was there right at the start. Yeah, you were there before any of the negative press, really, or that started while you were there. Well, I think really the first thing was the Jane, uh, mm -hmm. the Jane magazine interview with Claudine Co. And that was before I started working there. Oh, really? Yeah, that was uh, maybe six months before I started. Okay. And that is where I... Uh, you know, we got flyer bombed. It was like maybe my first month of work. Uh, overnight, these, you know, wheat pasters showed up and put flyers all over the store. And they said, the outside of the store and the street and Sunset Boulevard and everywhere. And they said, obey your master Bader, B-A-I. Sure. It was like an interesting pun. And it was, it, that was a reference to that Jane Magazine article. And I was sort of like, and you know, the manager was like, get into action, Dove. It could be here any minute. You know, I was like frantically peeling them off and I ended up saving one. And really it was at that moment when I peeled it off, it was like intact and I kind of tucked it away. And I thought, I'm going to write about this someday. Wow. I'm going to write about this someday for sure. You know, I, I had studied writing in college and I was always sort of, you know, I knew there would be some story I was going to write and that that was it. And I even told people, I'm going to write about this. Yeah, sure, sure. No one believed me. Yeah. It took a while, but uh, yeah. It's kind of remarkable you have these moments like that, and I do too, where you're like, how is that not the beginning and the end of it? Exactly. But it, it, it you, you, the mind finds a way to make it make sense or sure. not make it urgent or, or whatever. Yeah. Also, a big factor is... I mean, it seems like it's so close in our rear view, but 20 years ago was like a very different time culturally. Yes. Especially in that moment of um, celebrity sex tapes and upskirt shots and the girls had gone wild. And, That's true. Um, and I, as a feminist coming out of this like feminist college, um, wanted to, you know, be a sexually autonomous being and really sort of like embrace my sexuality. And here was this company that was so in your face, so open. I really felt like that was the next step in my feminist e evolving evolution. It, it made sense maybe within the the overall vibe of like sexual positivity. Yeah, you exactly. weren't supposed to be judging people. There wasn't supposed to be aberrant behavior. Everything was normal or on some yeah. kind of spectrum. And maybe everyone has this sense that there are lines, mm -hmm. but like because they weren't clear, it made it easy for 
or made it possible for people to kind of play the different groups off of each other. For sure, definitely. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm still a sexually positive sure. creature, um, but American Apparel was, you know, there's a lot of good things about it, but it was really sex positivity to the point of toxicity. Of course. Um, you know, like anything in the patriarchy, you can't get all the good stuff. Yeah, it's a, it's so it's so strange. So okay, so you get you basically get flyered off the street, and you have no idea that this thing is going to change the course of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, you mean when I get scouted? Yeah, yeah. Yes, and then yes. and then you just end. I mean, you start the way most people started in American Apparel, which is you started as a retail employee. Yes, and I was like, uh, you know, I had just spent a year writing at the Urban Outfitters headquarters, and so I was like, you know, I have other skills here. Yeah. Like I could be copywriting. I could. Sure. You know, that's what I've been doing. They're like, no, no, you stay here. Yeah. And I wanted to be a part so bad, I, I a part of things so bad that I did it anyway. They're like, here's the key. you know. And I showed up on time. I brought my East Coast work ethic where yeah. I showed up on time. They're like, whoa, you're in charge. And you know, I sort of stuck so a myself real job there. Oh yeah, it was definitely a real job. And it felt like a real job. It gave me health insurance. Sure. Um, it did pay a few dollars over what other retail jobs paid. I, In the long run, Urban Outfitters also really underpaid me. Uh, I was making the same, you know, um, but I was in charge. You know, I, I I had, well, I mean, I thought I was in charge. I had more responsibility and I felt more important. I felt like I was a part of things. Have you thought about what part of you it was or what it was that made you want to be a part of it so bad? Yeah. Um. I mean, I've always sort of, you know, um, like oper- wanted to operate on the fringes of things. Hmm. And you know, I came from like like a punk rock background and it always felt good to rebel. Um, even going to Bryn Mawr, which is such like a, a feminist uh, institution was a way to rebel. And so here is even another way to take it further. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think that some of the girls, you know, have like a sense of, or uh, sort of like vulnerability about them mm-hmm. um, that made them, uh, I don't know where I'm going with this, that made them um, easier to be victimized in a way. And maybe I didn't have that sort of vulnerability, um, which is why I didn't, you know, wasn't a dove girl or didn't get wrapped in. But yeah. I don't know, that might be a little uh, victim blaming. No, there there was a, there's a childlikeness mm-hmm. to most of the girls that he, why does my phone uh, I, have, I have never once turned on Siri on my watch on purpose, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> only on Max. Um, no, there, there was there was this sort of mix of like uh, adultness and childlikeness in the women that were in the company. Oh, definitely. Which sort of also is true Dove, of Dove, also. Of course, yes. But yeah, there was there was kind of a uh, yeah a childlikeness. Yeah. Well, because of his behavior, his yeah. sense of humor. Only teenagers are going to tolerate that shit. Like That's if true, I had a boss true. doing that, I'd be like, I know, yes. no way. And not because of my experience with American Apparel, just because of how I've grown and who I am now and, and culturally and all that stuff. Um, yeah, this is getting far afield. But I've always thought that's like, it's a strange thing we don't kind of talk about. Like the 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 older man who's attracted to younger women. Mm-hmm. I've never gotten the, you're 40 and she's 20. You exist in different universes. There's some. There's something, uh, how are you spending time together? Do you know what I mean? Like how, what, it, so, so I always thought, I always found it remarkable and probably should have also seen more alarm bells, but it was like, this was a person who was incredibly smart, incredibly successful, incredibly wealthy, incredibly powerful, incredibly stressed out and he wanted to be surrounded by what were effectively children. There was a Michael Jackson-ness to it where you oh, absolutely. You, do, you are clearly running from a kind of a real life. Yes, for sure. Yes, Neverland. Yeah. Exactly. Right, and the Playboy Mansion is a version of Neverland, and mm-hmm. the house was a version yes. of that. Yes, yes, the big house. I lived on just down from Apex Drive. He, I, I, I lived downtown, and at one point, and again, these things all seem like they make sense. He was like, I'll pay you to move closer to me. Mm-hmm. And he gave me like $5,000 to move 
to this house where I could see his house from my house. Yes. And I was like, I never even I, like it was obviously so he could call me at two in the morning and be like, I need you. And I'd have to go up there. And it was never urgent. There was never anything important. It was always mm -hmm. just something that a person with better boundaries would have waited until the next day to Absolutely. type in an email or whatever. But but then the the weird part about sort of those dynamics is there's the the person who doesn't have good boundaries and then the person who doesn't recognize that the other person you know what i mean like yes. why would you want to live close to your boss that's insane yes and yes. so it's this mutually uh reinforcing dynamic that happens yeah absolutely definitely so weird. And only a youth, only youth would fall for that. Yeah, because an older person would have kids or a spouse yes. or <laughs> hobbies or yes. you know they they would live in Northridge because they couldn't afford to live in yes, LA. And they would of course. commute it. Like there would be all these things that would yes. make that not. They would never answer the phone at two a.m. when your I boss know. is calling. Well, so I think that so I I feel like I kind of got saved in the sense that and I never did anything that I you know I never did anything that got me in trouble. I never like got sucked into it. I never like I never went too far in because one, I, I always wanted to be a writer, so I always had this other stuff going on. And I I didn't really want a job. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like the whole point was like, how do I not have a job? Yes. And then I I had I'd been with my wife. How long did it I'd been with my wife maybe a year. We weren't married, but we've been dating a year. And we stayed together the whole time. We're still together now. So like I through your American Apparel experience? Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh, wow. Um so so because of that, I yeah. never like it it there was I never could have lived in the house. I never wanted to live yeah. in the house. I never wanted to do any of the things that I think yes. people sort of told themselves were the the uh, unpaid benefits of working there. Yes. And in fact, I had to steer clear things. I didn't want to get in trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, yes, I, it, it just sort of it set up these guardrails yeah, that I think. You have one foot in the real world. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're 22, a man or a woman, mm -hmm. you're just like. I, you don't have anything going on. Yeah. And so you're like, this house is nicer than my house or whatever. <laughs> you know? Um, or you, you, the whole structure is designed to sort of alienate and disconnect you from yeah, stuff. You're traveling, you. you're staying. Absolutely. Not even in your own hotel room. It's yeah. just weird. I was so disconnected even from my family. Mm. Like that moment in time, I wasn't going home. I was sort of like avoiding their calls because I was so... Uh, just that was my world. My Did you feel world. like you were a really important like career woman? Uh, I was the most important one there. I was doing yeah. their hiring. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I no, was I, totally I mean, deluded. in the sense of like, like you were, you had a cell phone and it was oh, ringing all the yeah. time and you had, you were traveling for things that you yes. would have to work your way up Absolutely. a corporate hierarchy at a normal company to get to do. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're like, you're, it's like you're, you're playing pretend. Like mm -hmm. I was the director of marketing of a company that I, had no business being that, yeah. but I I had the keys to the car, yeah. you know? Yeah. And... Yeah. People were making my travel arrangements for me. I was flying to new cities to scout locations. Like, what did I know about which storefront was going to be the best location? Like, I had no idea. I had no... But I'm like, well, this one's good. It's near the Apple store. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. Um, so, so it, and it, it, you can have the cognitive dissonance there as you go... You have total imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. right? Like I have no business being there. I have to quit. This is insane. Or you go, actually, I am qualified to do this, mm -hmm. and and it, this is not insane. This is nor this is different. But actually, there the old way of doing it is crazy. This is actually the best way to do it, and I'm special. And he, they saw me. Oh yeah. And that's that's what it is. That's yes. what it was for me. I, I think that's what it was for a lot of the girls. Yeah. Yeah. Right, uh, you're you you feel chosen, and then that blinds you to the signs that maybe this is more random than you'd like to admit, or mm -hmm. based on something else you would like not to admit. Yeah, 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 definitely. It's fascinating. It's totally fascinating, and I think people should hear about it because it it doesn't. It's not like oh, this is this weird thing that these two people experience, but this is also how people get into weird industries that they don't understand. This is how people back political candidates they, you know, mm -hmm. or take job. You you tell yourself it's gonna be different for me. You tell yourself, oh, I'm not like those other people. It's different with me. And, and oh, what absolutely. you're doing is you're just working your, 
you're sort of dulling your conscience, you're dulling your sense of awareness, and you're just getting yourself deeper and deeper into something that in a lot of cases, it becomes really hard to get out, if yeah. not impossible. That's like any abusive relationship. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think still being with my wife, I think we have had to work through stuff. Like, because we would get in arguments where she'd be like, that's insane. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'd be like, what? This is my job, you yes. know? And so so it was like this process, like she, she probably feels gaslit by me, mm -hmm. but I wasn't aware of what was so it, like gaslighting i feel like requires a certain awareness of what you're doing yes. it's like a, a a person who's being fooled fools other people right yes. and yes. so there's this weird dynamic that i it's taken me a long time to have to process and get out of you you were so fortunate to have someone who wasn't in the company which is you know he encouraged us to date within the company of course. because of reasons like that yeah. there's a there's a podcast about american apparel where there's this heated debate i forget who it is or or i don't think i knew the woman but she was defending herself or, or just talking about working for American Apparel. And her partner was in the other room and he's like, I'm sorry, but I have to interject. Really? And he's the voice of reason. He's yeah. saying, and she's like, her point is, you don't understand because you're not there. You don't know what's really going on. Sure. And that's, you know, that's what I would have said too. Yeah. But it's so obvious to anyone looking at the situation what's going on but you are so wrapped up in these cult dynamics and your sense of purpose and tying your identity to the way that you're making money which is something that I will never do again you know I really conflated my the way I paid rent with my identity and um when it's so funny that yeah money is even entering here because you're making like 40 grand a year. Yes. Like you're not, you're, you know what? I never made it to 40. I think I topped out at like $32,000. I mean, yes. that, that was what I made when I left. Which was more then, but but like, yeah, it's, it's not. still not enough. Well, you, yeah, you would, you would sense from the outside that people were sort of debasing themselves or um, doing things that are potentially have ramifications later in your career. You yeah. go, oh, it's for the money. Mm -hmm. And and usually money is way down on the list of motivating factors. Like you go, why are these people working for this, yeah, this political candidate? Or why are people working in this industry? Money is part of it, sure. Mm -hmm. And some industries more than others. Yep. But usually it's a lot less than you think. Yep. Even like porn, you they're not mm -hmm. cleaning up. Yeah. You know, there there's other things that have happened first that get you to rationalize it and be okay with it and, mm -hmm. and even find a positive good in it. Mm -hmm. And then the money is just maybe the money is the one you tell yourself mm -hmm. because it's the the most logical mm -hmm. and the most socially acceptable mm -hmm. even, but yeah. it's not even the case. Yeah. It's so true. Like, it's not like there were private jets or like, no. you know, you go, I'm staying in a company apartment and it's like, what were they paying for that company apartment? Mm -hmm. Like $2,000. Like, you know, it's not, yes. these were these weren't like your corporate condos that you see in like an episode of Billions or no, something. these were like dumps. I remember the, the apartment in San Francisco is in the Tenderloin. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, here I am in the Tenderloin. Well, I was going to ask you, did you, maybe this is one area we intersected. Did you, were you the one that scouted the location in the Mission District in San Francisco? Did you pick that store? I don't think so. I did a lot of scouting up there for the, uh, um, the like whatever was in the Stanford area. That oh, was like Palo Alto. Yeah, Palo Alto. Okay. Yeah. No, oh. I didn't. I don't think I did anything there. I I had to stay. I stayed in the Tenderloin when I was doing the Palo Alto stuff because like that's where the company apartment was. I have stayed in that apartment. Yeah. So my one of my first like it was sort of in, you know into the furnace like or they throw you into the deep end. I probably worked mm -hmm. there for like three weeks, and I get, I get you have to go up to San Francisco and do this thing. And I go what? Yeah. And they go so there's there's some that there's some like protest about one of the stores. And what had happened was someone like you had gone like, I think we should open a store here. Mm -hmm. And so they'd signed a 10-year lease on a building in the Mission District. Not the landlord probably knew this the whole time and saw it, saw him as an easy mark. But there was a, a, a stipulation in like the business district that you couldn't open, uh, a, 
if you had more than 10 locations, you were considered a big box retailer mm -hmm. and you had to go through a special approval process to to exist in the mission district. Oh, interesting. It was a way to keep out keep like out. big corporations. Yeah. They didn't want like a Walmart Starbucks or something. There, yeah. yeah. And so uh well, American Apparel had like a hundred stores at this point. Yeah, I'm sure. And so they but they just signed the lease. Mm -hmm. And so and American Apparel just flying by the seat of its pants had put up signs, we're coming. Yep. And all of a sudden this huge protest, like, hey, they're trying to break the rules, whatever. And so there was oh, like a city a city uh council meeting or whatever. And they just sent me, a person who worked there like for three <laughs> weeks, I'm like 21, they were just like, go fix this, oh which God. was exciting on the one hand. Mm -hmm. And then obviously later did I realize it was like a lamb being led to slaughter. So I go up there and uh, I, I was, they told me I had five minutes to speak and uh, I get up there for, and um, I forget how it went. It was like, it was supposed to start at a certain time. We had to wait all this time. And you're just seeing like hundreds of people are just lining up to speak oh this thing. God. And uh, <laughs> you can see a picture of me. I'm wearing like a gray American apparel button up and it's just like black, just down the side. Yeah. I'm like sweated totally <laughs> through this shirt. And uh, I get up there and I'm supposed to speak for like five minutes. They go, actually, there's so many people, you have two minutes. Yeah. And so I get up there, I speak for two minutes. And then What like, did you say? You know, like, we didn't know, like, I don't know, like, I, they made, I wrote some speech, right, that that I'm sure nobody had approved. I had no idea what no, I was doing. I give this speech. And they're like, okay, uh, that's the, you know, the representative from American Apparel. You sit down here, and um, now we'll hear from the community. And then, in my recollection, like 200 people spoke, <laughs> <laughs> one right after another, all directing their very angry comments directly at, at me. You. Not yeah. a single person spoke in favor of it. And it, and then of course the store never opened and uh, the com the company took a huge bath. The, the mission has now since been totally gentrified. Of course. But I just remember going, this is my, like, like you're talking about with, with your, it's like, you're peeling off these masturbator signs. Like I'm, this is like my first month on the job. Yes. And I'm like, this is where I'm gonna continue working. This is a good place to work. Yeah. This is all normal. Yeah. Nothing's on fire. Yeah. And I never thought about it again until like years later. when I was like, what was that? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it, it's so funny. Yeah, and it was just some kid signed the lease. And then another kid cleaned it up. Yep. You know, that's just how it, yeah. how it was. I used to think it was a, you know, I, I had only been there maybe a month or two before Dove was like, go to New York and hire. Just mm -hmm. go go to New York and hire. Go tomorrow. And, you know, I'm like, what What does that mean? Where do I stay? Where, you know, uh, sure. just go to New York. And then then once I got to New York, they were like, okay, go start location scouting. Here, Here's a car. Just drive, you know. And um, that... I used to think it was like a trial by fire, but really it was just because the company was growing so rapidly. They just needed bodies to do these positions. And I was sort of responsible and here you go. And and, and it felt good. It made me feel good. Of course, yeah. I, felt, I interpreted it, it as I am the one who can do this. Yes. But, you don't go, this is a, poor, a bad way to run a company. And the reason yeah, no. I'm being hired to do it is because all the other people would never accept this job. You know what I mean? Like yes. th this is, they'd be like, I'm not going to work there. That yeah. company is circling the drain. Like they would have seen what that meant. Yeah. To me, it was so exciting. I'd spent a year working at the Urban Outfitters sure. headquarters and it was just, you know, like dismal beige colored cork board, like uh, boss in a button down. Um, everyone was significantly older than I was. Um, I was working for the e-commerce department, which was yeah. sort of like the redheaded stepchild of the sure. moment. Like it was the catalog was important yeah. in the stores. And um, it was so boring and miserable. And I felt, you know, we were selling T-shirts that said voting is for old people and a, a board game called Getopoly. It was like, I knew this is not me. This is not sure. who I am. I have to get out of here. So then going to this other company, which seemed so revolutionary and was growing so rapidly and was the total opposite of that work environment, yeah. was so incredibly seductive to me. Well, um, so the unraveling or how everything was so crazy, that that just fired me up even more. When it's hard when it's working to be like, this is not how it should be done. Because yeah, it's not like it, you had started totally. your own, you know, uh, $100 million apparel company and you're like, there's a better way to do this. Yeah. You, you're you just like, that way was horrible. Sort of, you know, sort of corporate suit 
you know, bureaucracy, then you go over here, you don't realize there's all these reasonable solutions between the two. Yes. It, the choice is not between yes. like tyranny and anarchy. There's yes. some there yes. right in between yes. that most successful companies are operating at. But you don't know that because you haven't worked there. Yes, because you're 20. Yeah, yeah. and it's also <laughs> boring. So that's not <laughs> talked about, yeah. right? Like the, yeah. the, the way most people operate does not enter the conversation because mm -hmm. it's by definition unremarkable. No, absolutely. Yeah, another thing people don't realize, how could you stay? It, it was a really fun job. It's true. It was an unbelievable amount of fun. Um, you know, the people that I met there are still some of my closest friends. And, um, you know, uh, what I wanted to talk about with you is sort of the idea of regret. And um, uh, sometimes at readings, people will say, if you had to do it all over yeah. again, would you do it? It's always like a Gen Z person. And I'm not really a regrets type of person. Um, and I would. I would totally have done it again. Yeah. You ha you're, you were in a little deeper, I think. Uh, I can, under you know, uh, I don't know. I want to know what you thought about that. No, regret is a hard word because I think we take that as meaning you sort of disavow that it happened and you're like that you. It's yeah. Regret. Regret is almost I think. I'm reluctant to go, I regret it. I would do it differently in the sense that it, it, you're saying like, you don't like where you ended up. But I I, I was talking to this woman, her, her name is um, Dr. Edie Eager. She's this Holocaust survivor. I was talking to her about something and she said, I'll, I was dealing with a different situation I, I had regret for. And she was like, I'll give you these magic words. And she's like, the magic words are, if I knew then what I knew now, I would do things differently, right? And so it's like, if I had awareness of certain things, I would have made different decisions. But I have the awareness I have now because of the decisions that I made and the things that I learned. I learned yes. so much about human nature and people. It was, you know, it, it be, it's like going back in time and, you know, like living at Versailles or something. You you just, you're like, oh, this is a, mm -hmm. a fundamental part of the human psyche. Like the way that you know, sort of hangers on, sort of circle around a powerful person and how cults of personality work. Oh, and, you know, it, and so like that taught me so much. Then I have this kind of, it's more like I have some embarrassment about the fact that I, it took me so long to understand what it was and what it was happening. Do you know what sure. I mean? Sure. No, absolutely. You, you say something in one of your pieces like, um, you know, you learned so much about yourself and how you respond to things. And it is, I mean, it was certainly was a character defining event for me. Yes. Um, talking to some of my friends who who have relationships with Dove and still do to some extent, they're like, yeah, you know, sometimes people will ask me, you know, what'd you do before this? And I'll say American Apparel and they'll say, oh, and I just kind of keep my mouth shut. You know, they're embarrassed. Yes. Um, well, and then and then you you see, yeah, you see people who still haven't, manage to swim free oh, and you I go know. oh okay so i have some regrets but my big my i feel good that i'm not that yeah you know what i mean yes there, I, you got to grade it on a curve of, yes. of how other people handled it yes it's so true uh you know most of well maybe not most but a few of the girls that i write about in striptease are still with him still living with him it, it it is remarkable like you get it i thought you did it very well in the book you're sort of talking about you're talking about how you you basically have this experience. You're like, I got to get out. And you go to get out. And then you sort of test the market and you realize, oh, it's harder to get out than I thought. And it's not as good. And you come back. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important because when people get out of things or they walk away from careers, or they, we tend to see it as this sort of epiphany moment that where it all became clear, you got moral clarity, and then you walk away. And it's not like that no, at all. That's a very idealistic, like Hollywood way of looking at things yes. that some people say. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. I, have you read The Harder They Fall? No, I haven't. It's this novel by Bud Schulberg. I thought I'd read you this passage. So I, I, I read this. I My understanding was that I read this right before I left American Apparel, which was in, I, I left to write my first book in 2011, but they were basically like, what if we just kept paying you and you didn't actually leave? So I stayed in for another three years. I left in 2014 after Dove was uh, 
which I can get into. But yeah. uh, so I so I left in 2014. So I, if you had said, when did you read the book that helped you realize why you shouldn't work there anymore? Mm -hmm. It must have been like around then, right? It should have been in 2014 or should have been in 2011 when you made the decision to leave. Because here's here's this passage. This is like the last page of the book. Um, let me see. Uh, he says, um, uh, the worst of them all, the biggest heel of them all, the only one who knew right from wrong and kept his goddamn mouth shut, the only one who knew the score, knew what was going on, and still kept his hands in his pocket. Uh, and he, this is a, a publicist mm -hmm. who's like, uh, become, starts working for a fighter that's uh, propped up by the mob. And, and then he says, um, I knew the goddamn trouble with me. I thought, enough brains to see it and not enough guts to stand up to it. Thousands of us, millions of us, corrupted, rootless, career-ridden, good hearts and yellow bellies, looking for living out our lives for the easy buck, the soft birth, indulging ourselves in the illusion that we can deal in filth without becoming the thing we touch. So I would have said, obviously, I read this, mm -hmm. and then I left shortly thereafter. And so I was going to write about that a couple years ago. And so I went, I was like, well, let me get the date. So I, I was like, I knew I bought it on Amazon. So I, I pulled up the Amazon release. You know, I type in the harder they fall. And it goes, you bought this book in September of 2008. Oh, my God. Like a year after I started. <laughs> and that's when I read it, too. Yes. So I read it. And th so I would have thought all this stuff happened. And then I read the passage and the light goes on. I make all the connections. In fact, the exact opposite happens. I read it at the beginning, beginning. and then and all the stuff happens. Yeah. So we have this sense that there's this moment where you get the clarity and it's not that at all. And in it's fact, not. most people who who turn, who become government witnesses or, you know, walk away from cults or whatever it is, it's it's not only not glamorous, it's usually even kind of a shameful, like ran out with their tail between their legs. It's only later that we're mm -hmm. like, oh, I get, and and so mm -hmm. that's actually given me a lot of empathy and sympathy now. Like it just matters that you changed your mind. It just matters that you got out. Yeah. It just mattered that you stopped doing it. I'm not gonna expect you to be perfect because I know it's really fucking hard to change your mind and to look back on past decisions you made and go, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Yes. The whole thing has made me so much more um, uh, sensitive or aware of, you know, people's bad behavior in the past or um, I'm just not as judgmental. I'm not yes. as judgmental as I was when I was 20, when I had everything figured out, when, you know, I could spot, you know, racism and sexism a mile away. Uh, it's just not that easy when the whole like cultural canvas around you is obscuring everything and when you need to make rent next month. You know, people are like, yes. I would have walked out of there. Like, I'm sure Becky on Goodreads, like, yeah, yeah you would have right away. You would have been out of there. But who was going to pay your rent? Like, I wasn't going back to Philadelphia. Yes. You know, I was not going to admit defeat. I was way too proud. Um and I stayed because I uh, because I had to. Because no, I, I, had to. I remember even when I did leave, like the American Barrel had very good health insurance. So then, you know, you, when you leave a job, you do COBRA, right? And mm -hmm. so all of a sudden you're paying, a, it was like $800 yes. a month. And, and like, thankfully I did have something else. But I remember mm -hmm. thinking, oh, this is why, mm -hmm. you know, if I was in a different place and had done things differently, I wouldn't have been able to leave. Yep. Mm -hmm. There's this um, there's this idea in, in Upton Sinclair's writing. He, he first off he has that that great quote. It's very hard to get someone to understand something that their salary depends on them not understanding, right? Which is the essence of working at American Apparel or yes. working for a certain political party or getting sucked into this or that. Like you don't want to see it because your paycheck depends on you not seeing it. Mm -hmm. But he also has this idea. He calls it like the dress suit bribe, and basically he's saying like. He's talking about some person who has to dress up in fancy clothes to work in finance or something. It's funny he's talking about this like a hundred plus years ago, but he's like, you know, you see yourself paying, he says, you know, five cents to get your shoes shined. He says, but you don't see yourself as someone who was paid to be a person who has their shoes shined, oh, yes. right? And so, you know, you don't think, like one of the things I was always hesitant about and I think it saved me, but other people were less careful. You don't realize all the different things that are happening along the way that are actually choices. They're actually 
you're actually getting bought and you don't realize it. Mm -hmm. And oh, it's hard to get out from it. Yes. Right? You can't, you, you get a nicer apartment, right? Yeah. You buy an expensive engagement ring. You, you know, you, uh, you get in a fight with your parents about having the job mm -hmm. and that, and now your identity, but also your lifestyle is now at risk if you were to change your mind about what you're doing. Yes, no, absolutely. There's um, in uh, one of the reviews of, of striptease, um, the writer quotes Margaret Atwood. Uh, it's amazing what someone can, I'm, I'm butchering this, but it's amazing what you can get used to provided there are a few compensations. Oh, that yeah. yes. is the story yes. of American Apparel for me, my, my why I stayed. There's a, if we're just quoting literature back and forth, there's a, there's a scene <laughs> in The Great Gatsby where uh, Gatsby goes to Nick and he says like, hey, I'm working on this thing. Um, maybe you could do me a favor and I think there's a little bit of money in it for you. Mm -hmm. And Nick has a vague sense of what Gatsby does and and he doesn't kind of approve. And and he, he says like, I always reflected later in life that my you know entire future de hinged on me politely declining that like mm -hmm. that that I made that I didn't accept the offer was a, a direction shift in my life because what happens is people go hey can you do this it, we think of bribes as like here's an envelope of cash mm -hmm. right but instead at American Apparel it was like hey I'll co-sign a lease for you right mm -hmm. or hey um you need a car yes Yes. You need a, a, a reliable car. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> yes, I do. Yes. And 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 so it, it's now you owe that person something. And the, the dynamic yes. is very hard to shift. You talk about this. You have this this experience that, uh, you know, in any sane universe would have resulted in people being fired or lawsuits being fi filed. Mm -hmm. And in, instead, the resolution is like, do you want a 1996 used Mercedes-Benz sedan? <laughs> yes. <laughs> From my fleet. Yes. 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 Do you want do you want a, an apartment you can pick it out? It has to be in Miami where you don't live and don't want to live. Right. But and yeah. It's, and it's uh, I'm offering you a year lease on it. Like it's not an asset that you get to keep. No. You know what I mean? It's not like let me solve your conscience with with a with an appreciating asset. It's yes. like let let me actually indenture you more towards me for yes. a, a set period of time. Absolutely. And so you don't, yeah, you don't. Like I remember at one point he had some relationship with like a car dealer and he would co-sign and they, mm -hmm. like so we would oh, sign yeah. these leases for people. And I remember mm -hmm. like thinking like these people are signing it all away for like three years of a Kia, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> like it, again, it wasn't yes. these weren't like Ferraris. No. These these were. And, and so you you end up the compensations don't we all like to think like my price is, you know, in the millions of dollars, but yeah. your price is actually just like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't like flying in coach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, then they have you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. And then, and then because they have you, then you do things mm -hmm. that you feel guilty about yeah. or that you have attachments to. Yeah. And then you are complicit. So now you can't get out. Oh, absolutely. Even down to, I, I remember he would say, you want clothes? Take what you want. This stuff is pennies to me. It's nothing. Take what you want. You know, at time it felt so special, and it it it, it does sort of um, it ingratiates you. You, you're you're in it. You're yes. thankful. Yeah. Well, and and so you you have that, and then the other. I I was struck by the scene you're talking about in the book where like you see someone in a photo shoot that you recruited, and so and the you now see those shoots a little differently than you than you did when you first started. And so I imagine there's kind of a a, a guilt slash a, mm -hmm. I'm part of this oh, feeling now. Yeah, oh, definitely. I yeah. mean, I hired hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, you know, I, that was one situation where I really, you know, I knew the girl, she was so young when I hired her and here are these photos um, with the infamous white duvet, you know, just about a year later. Yeah. And, um, but you know, I do, I feel bad about that. Um, but really, I, 
you know, there's definitely some like Gen Zers who stand up at these readings, like, you know, actually you're complicit and you brought all those, how many women, you know, mm -hmm. were, but I mean, really that is just putting all the response, like at the time I was hiring for the biggest, you know, people don't realize how big the company was. Sure. Um, everyone wanted to work there at, at, towards the end. I mean, I was hiring for mall stores, Yeah. you know, the vast majority of people I hired would, their only contact with Dove would be, you know, on a conference call. Sure. Um, uh, and I think that to say, you know, you're to blame and you were part of this when I was so young and, and wrapped up in this systemic patriarchal capitalist system mm -hmm. is just a, a, another of those sort of idealized Hollywood things because um, – Really, I was hiring for a huge store, and the responsibility was on Dove's shoulders not to date these high schoolers, yes. not to abuse his employees. Uh, you know, it's not about me hiring people to work. You know, essentially, it was like the gap. Yeah, no, I, I mean, there's just, it's a blurrier line between victims and victimizers, mm -hmm. and and there's a hierarchy of them, right? Yeah, and and it's it's I'm I'm pointing out more. I think that. You're just you just feel yourself becoming part of this thing, oh, yeah. and then it's easier for you to think the thing is okay mm -hmm. than to think, oh, I'm part of the problem. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, for sure. And and so so it's a carrot and a kind of a stick thing, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like you have all these benefits of doing it, so and it's hard for you to see what's happening, and then the, in the moments where you start to feel guilt, you realize, oh, if I if I kind of tug at this thread, mm -hmm. or if I look too hard in this mirror. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to feel some feelings that I don't want to feel. So it's easier mm -hmm. just to keep going. Oh, absolutely. Or, or it's easier just to, you know, make certain you know, um, rules inside it that you feel okay with, instead of going. But the whole fucking thing is not okay. Mm -hmm. yes. Like I, I told myself I was staying at a certain point, especially after I was like, I'm, I'm gonna be a writer. I got this book deal. Why am I still here? I mean. There, there is. Uh, I, I heard someone once say that heroin and a salary are the two hardest, you know, addictions to quit. You know, mm -hmm. to just go like, "Hey, I'd like to not be paid anymore" is a hard yes. thing to do yes. at twenty five. Absolutely. Um, but, but you're isolated in a new city. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I think. But what I told myself is, I can protect these people. Like these are mm. my people. I had this yeah. group that I had hired or had come into my department that I was the one, Dove talked to me and not to them, mm -hmm. right? And if sure. I went away, then how long would they last? Or yep. what unpleasant experiences would they have? So you 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 go, oh, I'm doing it for this. I, I'm one of the good guys inside the system or whatever. Yep. And yeah. you don't go, what kind of system has good guys, what, what kind of system needs good guys inside <laughs> yeah. of a bad system? You don't think that, you just go, Hey, I'm like you you go, I'm the person who's pulling papers off Trump's desk to yes. keep us in NATO or whatever. And yeah. it's true, somebody <laughs> does have to do mm -hmm. I, I heard this great line. It was um apparently they tell these people in law school, they go, Everyone is entitled to a lawyer, but it doesn't have to be you. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So but but that's what you do. You go, if I don't do it, someone worse will do it, or yes, I'm doing it and yes. I'm doing it differently than these other people. And that's the that's ultimately the lie that helps you rationalize mm -hmm. what feels like not doing what feels like a very scary thing that by the time you end up doing it, leaving or whatever, you're like, wait, this is what I was scared of. This is just regular life. Like yes. it's not that big a deal. Yes. But that's how oh, yeah, for sure. that's the dynamic that I think yeah. keeps people complicit. Yes. Oh, definitely. When I left, I mean, I stayed for the company for three years. You know, striptease covers my first year. And yeah. you would think anyone would leave after that year. No, yeah, I stayed for three years. I was laid off at the start of the recession and I cried. I was so sad. I, I couldn't imagine my life without American Apparel, without my friends. I was like totally lost. Yeah, you, you cry for losing a job that you had tried to quit. Mm -hmm. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, after, um, yeah, I just fell in deeper and deeper. I, I, you know, it was the devil I knew. Um, I certainly didn't want to go back to working for a company like Urban Outfitters, which sure. was corrupt in its own way. And, um, yeah, I stayed. And then I went into reality television, <laughs> a, a really great, great, you know. But, again, I, I had learned that lesson where I don't conflate my 
yes. identity with what I do to pay the rent. Yeah, you 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 think it's going to be so awful, and in fact, it's not. No. Like the, the people I, I I interviewed um, Adam Kinzinger, the Republican congressman who was on the January sixth commission. He was like, he was just talking about. It. He's like, my life is way better now. Yes. But he's like, you don't. He's there's something oh, about yeah. not wanting to be an ex congressman. He's like, mm-hmm. actually, it's more lucrative. My conscience is clear. I have more time. I get to see my family. I can live where I want. But there's this this there, the status quo bias mm-hmm. is such an enabling factor. Oh gosh, absolutely. I felt such shame. Like all of my friends who were uh, most of them sleeping with Dove, you know, they weren't going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. They were staying at least for the next, you know, five to 10 years. I mean, for me, it was like, I was worried about getting fired from a job I was trying to quit. Yeah. You know, like, like oh, I wanted yeah. to be a writer. I moved, like, so basically I, I called Dove and this would have been like, March of 2011, and I said, "Look, I'm going to write this book. It's going to be about media. You're going to be partly in it, but like, I this is what I'm here for. Like, this is yes. what I always th- this is what I wanted to do." And he's like, "You got to talk to to Tina. Uh, you probably knew Tina. Um, mm-hmm. uh, he's like, you got to talk to Tina. She'll she'll figure out the details with you." And Tina was like, "Nobody will care. Just we'll, we'll reduce your salary. You just keep writing. You go live where you want to live. Write your book, and we'll need you on some stuff." Mm-hmm. What ended up happening is like they basically. I basically just negotiated a salary decrease and I still had to do you the same job. So. so like I thought God. I was pulling something over on someone. In fact, I was getting, but yes. but like. That's the dub turning away. I remember when he put me on salary at 30, he was like $30,000 <laughs> a handshake. I was like, oh. no, and then later won't. I was like, wait a minute, $30,000 and I'm working overtime every day and I'm stuck here in Florida working with him. Shit. But it felt so great. You thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like here's a way that I don't have to pay you overtime. Um, yeah, because that's all. That's what it was before. Totally. I was making way more before an overtime traveling. I was an hourly. <laughs> I totally screwed myself, and there I was for the next two years on that salary. But then things would happen, and I like you know moments that I should have left, and I didn't, because I didn't want to get fired from the job that I literally Hell had yeah. already quit in my head like yeah. it was all found it was all house money at that point and still you don't want to walk away from the because it, it's just different quitting and getting fired are different oh absolutely and because oh, you gosh. have a choice in one even though rationally they're yes. the exact same thing and and they're both getting you what you say you want which is free and clear of this yes thing. yes yes so so interesting yep uh or that's the other thing is like when you find yourself like I talk about this in Courage's Calling, you find yourself being asked to do things that you shouldn't do or you know are not right. You go, well, I don't. If I say no, if I don't do, it, I'll lose my job. And you're like, why do you want to keep a job where you can get fired yeah, for, for doing this thing that you know you're was, not supposed to do? Yeah, just for doing what you think is right. No, yeah. absolutely. Like, why is this an yeah. issue at all? Those were dark days at the end. I, I it's so crazy. I you have well, to deal with all that. It was not. I mean, he. He basically descended into insanity for a lot of the reasons yes. that you predict in yes. the book, which is he doesn't sleep. No, the sleep deprivation is something like, you talk about that. I mean, yeah. that is really the crux of so, so much of it. And, you know, my sister's a, a clinical psychologist. She diagnoses him. Uh, oh, you with know. hypo, some yeah, sort of hypomania? Uh, yes, 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 exactly. You know, a lot of CEOs have that. You're you're up all the time. It's called um, hyper, oh, I can't believe I can't think of it right now. Yeah, it's not ADD. It's something. It's something. It's a. It's just. It's a sort of a. It's almost like a bipolar kind yes, of energy but without just the on crashing. The one side. That's exactly. Yes. Yes. You know, does he eat? I'm like, no. You know, I, I really can't think of many situations where I've ever seen him eat. It's always the Nest Cafe. You know, does he sleep? No. I see him the next morning. He's wearing the same clothes. He's been talking on the phone to me all night. Of course, he hasn't been sleeping. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you get you. You don't realize you're not supposed to be getting calls from the CEO of a company. Hyperthymic temperament. Yeah. Does that sound right? I think that's what you call it. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would get these calls at like three or four in the morning and we would talk and it'd never be it'd never be like the store is on fire. You know, it'd be like, I was thinking, what if we you know, it's like some and I realized it was two things. One, it was oh a control. It was a, oh, I'm always working. I expect you to always, always be, working. be working. I came, this is one of my little tricks is that every Christmas, Thanksgiving, whatever, I would call him in the morning. Mm-hmm. I would, And I would just call him t- for some nonsense. Yeah. And then he would think I was working and then he would leave me alone. Oh, that's so um, interesting. But, but um, it was a control thing. And then it was something that only now that I'm older and I'm my own life, I find to be quite sad, which is like mm-hmm. he literally had no one to talk to. Mm-hmm. He was, it was a terribly sad life. And he was 
he was, it could have been anyone that he was calling, yeah. but he was just talking to someone until he fell asleep. Because if he had silence, mm-hmm. then the silence might lead to self awareness. Yeah. And that would, that Absolutely. was a deal breaker. Yes. Those late night calls. Uh, it seemed like mostly he would call men late at night. I'm not really, really? sure why, but uh, my other friends who managed stores, he, uh, the manager of one of the Hollywood stores, he got those calls in the middle of the night too. Really? He was not really a high level employee. He was just someone that Dove liked and he would get those late night calls of nothing important, just business nonsense. Um, it was very interesting. Yeah, when I started my own company, I I would still do, I would sometimes call people. I'd be no. like, oh, I have this idea. It's 1130, I'd call someone. And my yeah. wife was like, you can't do that. That's <laughs> yeah. not normal. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's abusive. You know, I was like, oh, I guess. No. But I was like, but I've been getting calls. And, and I was like, oh, wait, yeah, that's this isn't what anyone signed up for. Yeah. And, it's, and the people that will accept it not, are not yeah. the people that you want working with you. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you want people yes. who have options. Yes, oh, and absolutely. And people who have options don't want to be called at two in the morning. Yeah. Unless it's important. Yeah. No one wants to be business all the time. And that is Dove Charney. Um, I, I sold the option for this book and they're writing the script now, the strike's over. And they were like, we need some warm, fuzzy Dove moments. Yeah. And I'm like, warm, fuzzy Dove moments. Like when I look back over the three years, I can't remember any conversations that were not about work, except for one. Mm. There was one time that he talked to me about something social. We were in Miami. It's the climax of this book. It's rough, working like crazy. Just the two of us in the store, this this store that was on Ocean Avenue, a store that is not built for retail. Yeah. It is just bars and restaurants. And he signed this 10-year lease on this incredibly expensive storefront that we were selling like two t-shirts and a towel a day. Probably because he visited that street when he was a teenager and it was implanted in his memory that that's somehow the American dream is to have a store on Ocean Avenue. A block away from the Versace mansion, which literally was a block away. Mm -hmm. You know, right on the beach, right on the beach. And um, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. So we were working, working. I was so exhausted. And he looks over at me and he says, do you watch The Sopranos? And I was like, oh, my God, he watches television? Like, yeah. And then I, you know, I was thinking, oh, my gosh, does he relate to Tony? Yeah. You know, like sure. the bad guy with the heart of gold, you know, he watches The Sopranos, huh? And so I'm sort of ready for him to, and I'm like, yeah, I watch The Sopranos. I think it might have yeah. been uh, the last season. It might have been that that year. This is 2006, maybe. Or it is in 2006, but I'm not sure where Sopranos were. But um. So I'm like, whoa, is it about Tony? Like, what, what could he see? And he says, that Melfi man, she is hot. I'm like, oh, God. Yes, the, the psychiatrist is hot, which at the time, you know, Melfi's, you know, an older woman. I, I wasn't so, she wasn't so hot to me. But um, now I see, like, yeah, Melfi is hot. Like, still, even in his, even in just talking about television, it was like back down to Melfi's hot. It wasn't he, anything deeper than that. I, I had a moment. Did you... Uh, since we're just quoting television shows now, um, did you watch Succession? No, I didn't. I- so there, there's a scene towards the end of Succession where mm-hmm. the Rupert Murdoch character takes his bodyguard out to like some diner in New York mm-hmm. City. You know, his family's all alienated from him and he just goes like, you're my buddy. You're my pal. You're my mm-hmm. best friend. And mm-hmm. you're just like, oh, this yeah. is so sad. Yes. And I, I yes. remember one time he, he had me over to the house to do something. And then it was like, he was like, do you want to go... Have dinner. He like we went like antique shopping, and then, and then we had like dinner, and and it was just like re- I realized he didn't have anyone to do these things with, yeah. and that this the cost of all of the success was that he was this machine that couldn't be turned off. Yes, and what seemed like this immensely rich and envious life was probably a prison in some ways. And it was a prison built on what also must have been a profoundly sad and awful childhood. Did he ever, have you watched The Apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz? Did you ever hear him talk about this? 
No. So it's, so it's a novel, which he, of course, did not read. Mm -hmm. But the novel was made into a movie with Richard Dreyfuss. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, he's this sort of Jewish hustler kid, like a street kid mm -hmm. who's ambitious, who's like got this knack for sales and yeah. trading things up. And it's it's based in Montreal, like all the places that Dove oh would have gosh, went as a kid, like yes. all his favorite restaurants. And so I remember one time he had me he had me pirate the movie to put it on the intranet, like the company yeah, server. Yeah, of course. So he could whenever <laughs> he would hire some some kid, he'd be like, Go to this link and watch, yeah, you know. Yeah, 48 Laws of Power. Yeah, watch yeah. this movie. Yeah. It was that movie. And and so at one point I was like, I'm going to go actually, I watched the movie. I stomped around all the places in Montreal and one of those, tr you know, things where every, the whole center of the company has to go to this place. But then mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to actually read the book. Mm -hmm. And so I read the book. And the, the premise of the book is basically it's this hustler kid who has the love of this young, uh, like his, his girlfriend. And then he has a father and a grandfather. And the grandfather is the person he admires mm -hmm. more more than anything in the world. And the, the grandfather basically says something like, you're not a man if you don't own land. Yeah. <laughs> and like that basically it was this sort of Jewish experience that you had mm -hmm. to like make your stake in the world, get successful, and then no one could fuck with you. Mm -hmm. And then you were like, you were not a nobody. Yeah. You, you'd have made it. And so he he's this hustler. He's trying to do this. And he ends up, long story short, ends up basically betraying all his values to get this piece of land yes. that when he brings his grandfather to see, his grandfather's like disowns him because he knows what he did, he did that the kid misses it. And so I, I always got this sense that Dove had this sense that if he could just become successful enough, do enough, uh, be popular enough, you know, somebody that rejected him early would oh, love him, whether it was his parents or probably more realistically, whatever, whoever the quintessential American apparel girl was, that was the girl that stood him up for prom or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Or humiliated him in some way. Yeah. There was some like urge to, if he just did this stuff, then mm -hmm. he would not feel bad, that the stress yeah. and pain would go away. Yes. And one of the most painful lessons you learn in life is that you cannot fix Mm -hmm. internal pain with external accomplishments or accumulation. So he Isn't gets the there, truth? he gets to the literally yes. like one of the highest mansions in Los Angeles. Like yep. you're looking down on the rest of Los Angeles mm -hmm. and you're a fashion icon. You have more than of anything you could possibly want and you're just sad and lonely. Mm -hmm. Yes, which is why with Los Angeles apparel, I, you know, of course he thinks he'll do that again. Yeah. He has to do it again. He can't do anything else. He will He has do to it roll again. the ball up the hill, yeah. even if it rolls yeah. all the way and back down. The ball down. is kind of rolling up the hill. Like I, some young person was like, oh, I, I didn't know that Los Angeles apparel used to be American apparel. I had no idea. They only know Los Angeles apparel. Right. Like it's. But it, and, and it's interesting. It's like his aesthetic is so singular mm -hmm. and unique that it, it, it almost can't be based on any kind of like rational, like I think this looks good. It's it's something like psychosexual that's oh, like implanted in it's his brain. It's a conversation. Brain. Yeah. This is, the, this is the image he wants to portray. And why is that? This I is, have well, all this kinds is the of world he wants to live in. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Where people dress this way and things look this oh, way. Yeah. This is, this is it, it's it's like, it, it helped me understand certain artists that it's like, oh, it's not just like, oh, you like painting this. It's like, this is something that's like inserted between you and the yeah. world. And that's how you fundamentally see the world. And you can't yeah. not see no. it yes. any other way. Yeah. That's why he's so unmanageable. That's why yeah. the company just totally imploded. Yeah. Um, because you cannot change Dub Charney. You can't convince him. You can't use logic. He is who he is and it's, and still is. And it's, again, we, we think these things are about money or power. And it's it's so clearly something way deeper than that because so he had like hundreds of millions of dollars of reasons to not do yes, this it's so and he true. can't not he can't not do it yeah so, so i was involved when the board decided to fire him and i found out that i had sort of written out this email like the board was so disconnected and so mm -hmm. they were sort of like 
because he wanted it that way. He picked, it was a handpicked board of people who yeah. liked him and stuff. And so they're kind of like, we don't know what's happening. Can you like give it? And I wrote this thing and I, I eventually found out that this email had made its way back towards Stove because it was, it, it came up in one of the lawsuits. But I sort of wrote down this email of all mm-hmm. this, all these problems. And, and so when they, when they fired him, they said they basically went to him and they said, "Look, you've got this is the meeting where he's bringing the shoes in to show off these new shoes." I think so. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and he's like, uh, you know, he thinks, you know, even though the share price is seventy cents, banks won't lend to him. Sales are cratering. Mm-hmm. You know, he's been sued a gazillion times. He's firing all the people left in the company, and you know, he's just spent months living in this this shipping facility yes. in La Mirada. Um, and, you know, he thinks it's going to be rubber stamp as usual. And instead, they're basically like, look, this is going to go one of two ways. Mm-hmm. You can resign as CEO, keep all your shares, which are currently worth tends of millions. But if we turn it around, you'll be worth, you'll be a billionaire. And we'll give you a million dollar a year consulting contract. And we won't tell anyone why this happened, mm-hmm. right? Or... This is the press release we're going to send out, and uh, you're going to be terminated for cause. You'll lose everything. Yes. He's like, you know, eating Nescafe raw <laughs> in cold yeah. water, or whatever, just addicted to caffeine and energy. And, and he's like, I need to think about it for a second. He walks out of the room, and then he comes back and he goes, I reject both options, and proceeds to try this hostile takeover, which you know, he must have known was not going to be successful. Yeah, this is the standard general This stuff. is the standard general, so which is not going to be successful. And, and, and I mean, he goes to them and he said, and he says, I've been wrongfully terminated from my company. I've done nothing wrong. And they said, really, you've done nothing wrong. He said, I've never harmed a fly. I've never harassed an employee. I've never, mm-hmm. and, and, and they were like, okay, we'll put up all your shares as collateral. And if you are vindicated by an investigation, you'll will give you the company, whatever. And if not, you know you're gonna lose everything. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I want that. And and he mm-hmm. must the he must have known. Like I knew he wouldn't pass this investigation, and I was only one of dozens of people that they interviewed. You know, and so he there was there was some part of him that basically said like this. You talked about you identifying. He said, I would rather it not exist than mm-hmm. me not have it because it is me, yeah. you know? And so he effectively destroyed yeah, he the company. the whole thing for everyone. And he did it all from a booth at Farmer Boys across the street. Oh, that Farmer Boys. <laughs> because he was banned from the premise. And so oh he God. set up shop in that Farmer Boys. Oh my God, I did not know that detail. And he would just watch who came and went and the employees that were still loyal would go over there for lunch. Mm-hmm. And they basically just plotted oh destroying God. the thing that he, and he might, he, there's no rational way not to have known that how it would go any other way, but then it was beyond rational at that yeah, point. He, yeah, that doesn't matter. I mean, I'm sure, I, I think he did think he could do it and pull it off. He's pulled yeah. off everything else. Yes. It, that's You realize what the superpower is, is the ability to so convince yourself of something that you're able to convince other people. I mean, I, it's yeah, changed. That's his story. Well, it changed how I saw, I mean, I watched representatives from George Soros's company come in mm-hmm. and he convinced them to give him a ton of money. And then Ron yes. Burkle, like p- sharks, you know? Mm-hmm. And he convinced them like, I'm not crazy. Everyone else is crazy. I can be reformed. You know, he yes. his, his thing was that he could convince other people mm-hmm. that white was black and black was white and that mm-hmm. he could bend reality to his yeah. will. Yes, yeah. So when people are like, why didn't you just leave? Like, do you know what we were up against? Well, and for him, why didn't he walk? He couldn't. Yeah. He couldn't. Oh, no, could not. No. No. That's why he's still doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, With the same it, people. Some uh, of the same people. A lesson I took out of it, too, was, okay, so the whole idea is fucking nuts, right? Mm-hmm. Like, we're going to make clothes in America. We're going to pay people a fair wage. We're going to do it in an uh, old building in Los Angeles. We're going to own our own stores. We're going to do our own marketing. Every 
every part of that. It's going to be done in this one little building. Each one of those is probably a bad business decision. Mm -hmm. Cumulatively, it's deranged. (laughs) It, it, It flies in the face of all conventional understanding of the apparel and fashion business in the 2000s, right? And it worked. He did it. And it not just worked, but he was paying, you know, people whose other choice was to work in a sweatshop. They were suddenly making a family, you know, two, two were making 80, 100 grand a year with benefits, you know, in great working conditions. Mm -hmm. He did it. Yep. So the problem, I think, for entrepreneurs, artists, people, leaders is like, everyone tells you, that it can't work and that you're a madman for considering it. And then you do it. How do you then go, I should probably hire a competent CPA yes. <laughs> or because I, we need a we need a director of finance. We need a whatever because the board says it's a good idea. Mm-hmm. You're like, fuck the board. Yeah. Fuck what the Wall Street Journal says. Mm-hmm. You know, fuck what the lawyers say we have to do. Mm-hmm. They told me none of this would work in the first place. Yes. And that... That in in that success, you are sowing the seeds of your own destruction. It's so true. It's so true. It's the eye alone can fix. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. You you like everyone who offers me advice or feedback or warnings is a hater mm-hmm. plotting my destruction. When in fact they're like, people have driven off this cliff a lot of times, and yeah. we're trying to help yes. you. Yes, we're showing you some red flags here. Yeah, when we say you should sleep or not, you, we should sleep like in your bed, and you should, by the way, <laughs> not sleep with your employees. Mm-hmm. This is not like our personal moralizing judgment. Mm-hmm. This is like, these are th- mm-hmm. the sirens yes. that you know destroy the ships yeah. in these waters. Exactly. And you know his reaction when people would say, you know, you shouldn't sleep with your employees. The heart wants what it wants. You sort of say with like a half smile on his face. Like, yeah. yeah, that's your ruin. The heart, the ego, whatever that is. Yeah, a friend of mine interviewed Dove on a podcast. I think it's maybe the last one he did. And he was he was like, Dove, I want to like describe to you this hypothetical. He was like, you're running American Apparel and I'm a Wall Street or I'm the board. And I say, you can't eat peanuts. You just can't eat any more peanuts. Uh, and if you eat any more peanuts, like you lose everything. Why can't you just not eat peanuts? And Dove just goes, I should be able to sleep with who I want. Like, <laughs> he, he, like even like, like he can't, it was so, it was so triggering. Like he couldn't even continue the conceit of the metaphor. No, um, no, the allegory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like yeah. for, for him. Yeah. Just straight up libertarianism. Right. Well, it's it's yeah. It's it's a lack of discipline and ethics and empathy well, course, and all yeah. of these things that ultimately, yeah, like running running a company that you do all these already crazy things in economically can't mm-hmm. also have this mm-hmm. other liability on top of it. Yeah. But ultimately, you probably realize the company was always a means to an end to do the other thing. So it's mm-hmm. not like, 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 he didn't, he didn't want to run the company. He wanted mm-hmm. what he thought the company would give him, which is the thing. So to, to say, hey, it's like the person wants to be president because they want the power, not because they have the policy. So you're like, hey, your thing oh, is yeah, engendering absolutely. the policy. They're like, fuck your policy ideas, like all I want is to be the guy at that desk. Yes. Yes, for sure. Yes, that's American Apparel. Oof. That's such an interesting way to think about it. Which way? What you just said. Oh. It's and then and then who because are we? I, I I do think that he has a genuine concern for those factory employees. I mean, you know, yeah. he was crying about it when all that was going down. Yeah. It, it's he like he sacrificed all that though. Yeah, he uh, I talk about this in the book I'm writing now. He had this North Star and then like because I remember one time, speaking of a human moment, I remember one time we were talking and someone was saying something like, if you do this, you'll make more money. Like some if we move this here, we do this here. And he said, like, if I wanted to make if all I cared about was making money, I'd have become a drug dealer. And that stuck with me. And I was like, Oh yeah, we make these deci- we we make these decisions, we pick these paths in life where we're saying money is not my main thing. Yeah. And then all we think about is money, mm-hmm. right? Which mm-hmm. it's like, you already said this is more important. And so that was great. He was like, oh yeah, this is a business and it's a capitalist business and it's designed to make a profit. It doesn't work if it doesn't make a profit. But his point was, 
profit's not the main thing, or even the, it's not the only thing or even the main thing. But the problem is that sort of North Star of like, hey, what I'm actually trying to do is, you know, make a great company, not fuck anyone over in the process, blah, blah, blah. This gets another North Star, maybe lower down on the body becomes his yeah. priority. Yeah, no, and now he's he's making some <laughs> other some other thing is leading him mm-hmm. in these different decisions. And, you know, when when he was making the decisions based on the the North Star, he was doing heroic, wonderful amazing things Mm -hmm. and then when he was driven by something maybe more primal Mm -hmm. or sexual it made horrible decisions that had horrible consequences for him and for other people yeah yeah definitely but those two things were always there right from the beginning i mean that jane mag article he was devastated when it came out I, i just heard through the grapevine but he got so much press from it you know how could that have building not been the his end like of it? perv brand? I know. How could that not have been the end of it? But or or even to, and I'm sure you heard his explanation for what was happening. But how, who would it, who would endanger everything that mm-hmm. they had to yeah. do that? And you realize, oh, this isn't a person. Yes. This is a this is a series of compulsions mm-hmm. uh, inside of a skin suit. Yes. <laughs> you know, like yes. Yes. that's not like yes. that's not what. <laughs> So yeah. Do you have you would a, a person, regular person wouldn't do that. And may, maybe the argument is like they were they were they were separate or they, they were these things were intertwined. You know, you have your your there's like a civil war. You have your north and your mm-hmm. south, right? And sometimes you're motivated by one, sometimes the other. But the the good parts winning out most of the time. Yes. Or you wouldn't have gotten as far as you were. The problem for him is then he's not sleeping, he's not taking care of himself, he has no hobbies, he has no Mm-mm. family, he has no nothing balancing him out. And the ability to regulate, to know, hey, this is a trivial mm-hmm. give to the lower urge, or this is a uh this is I'm I'm going all in on this thing. Mm-hmm. You you lose the ability to to re- to regulate and to make decisions and to evaluate risks, and you yes. end up inevitably imperiling all of it because yeah. I know. And that's the saddest part. Yeah. Like I come from a little town in Pennsylvania. It's just like a hillbilly hamlet. Yeah. But, you know, there were factories there. There were clothing factories. There was a vinyl factory. There were all factories. Yeah. And then it was it was a coal town. And then when that fizzled out, then there were these factories at least providing jobs and dignity to sure. the people that live in this valley. Yeah. And then um, because of Democrats, because of NAFTA, you know, all of those jobs were sent away. And now it is just an opioid pit. Yeah. And um when I saw what was happening with American Apparel, I, you know, which was just the effects of all those jobs leaving when I was in high school were just sort of starting to, to show. And um, that's actually what my second book's about. I'm really mm-hmm. excited about it. Um, and I saw, like, look how he's doing this. Yes. We could do this everywhere. We could bring those jobs back. And, I mean, it's more important now than ever. Yeah, I think for me, it's like all it's everyone so I knew or everyone my generation was celebrating was all like internet entrepreneurs mm-hmm. oh, making yeah. like social networks and apps. And I was like, this is real. This is stuff you can touch. Yes. This is a building. They're, they're not going, hey, you know, Instagram just sold for a billion dollars. We have eight employees. Yep. This was like, we're celebrating the fact mm-hmm. that 12,000 people work here, yes. you know, and, and that that is all true and real and good. Yeah. And, and that's they're cheering the, when he walks by. Yeah. I mean, and you just need to see that once. And that so that's what made the tragedy of all of it. Oh, my gosh. Awful. And then towards the end that he would that there was no part of him. You know, it's like, look, for all of Nixon's flaws, he basically resigns so as to not throw the country into a constitutional crisis. Mm -hmm. He respects, as much as he wants the office for himself, Mm -hmm. he he so lionizes the office and the idea of the office that he leaves before it's destroyed. Yes. And Dove had this moment, right, to go, the jig is up, I'm still rich, I'm still, you know, I still got these groupies around. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna walk away and I'm not going to throw you know, 8,000 sewers yes. onto the streets. Yes. But he can't do it. Yeah. And that that is what Duddy Kravitz is. Like, he has mm-hmm. this idea that he mm-hmm. wants this land, and the land is everything. And even when, basically, by cutting corners, his friend gets paralyzed, and he could have spent the... Like, he he trades everything to get this thing. Yeah. And... And the, the grandfather's not wrong. He sees, he goes, I see what you become to get this. Yes. And that's the tragedy. It's like 
the the tragedy of American Apparel is that the guy first says he cares about his workers, but he only cares about the blue collar workers. Doesn't mind exploiting mm-hmm. and abusing, you know, the woman making thirty thousand dollars a year mm-hmm. or the college intern or whatever. Yep. And then when push really comes to shove, and he has to choose between himself and all of those people, mm-hmm. he chooses those he chooses himself yes yes i I said that to him towards the end you said that to him yeah i said something like you're in like such a unique position of being able to say things like that to him like that i I could never it wouldn't have i've never seen anyone stand up to him or or i said something like i was like i agreed that you should have been fired but even if i hadn't who you were and what you did after Mm -hmm made yes. you worthy of that happening to you. And, and what did he say? Of course, nothing, you yeah. know, uh, just, you know, a wall of victimology and, yeah, you know, is. anger and resentment and yes. and all this stuff. You couldn't see it. Um, but, but because of course he never did anything wrong. He was totally innocent and he was mm-hmm. always being persecuted. Yes. He, um, which, which, I should have seen from the beginning. I, of course. But yeah. he, that that's how I, it's like, even if he had been innocent, an innocent person wouldn't have taken it all with them. Yes. Yes. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. Just like a person, I think in your book, you, it's like, it must have been a moment for you when you saw all this stuff happening around you. And, you know, maybe it's wrong, maybe it's right, maybe he's, and then something happened to you that wasn't him. Mm-hmm. Like an employee who I, I uh, we should talk about. Yeah. <laughs> an employee, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I could, I think I could guess through the pseudonyms. Um, but, but somebody basically jumps on you mm-hmm. and. Kavanaugh's me. I think yes. it's like sort of the best description of that event. <laughs> oh, that's horrible. Uh, but, but. His instinct wasn't to protect you. Mm-hmm. When Dove finds out about it, his instinct is, how do I make this go away go so it away. doesn't inconvenience me? Yes. And fundamentally, what happened to you is not any less awful than a person paying some refugee or migrant worker eight cents an hour to so close. Mm-hmm. It's exploitation Absolutely. and it's abuse and it's wrong. Mm-hmm. And he had just decided that some things he cared about and some things he didn't. It's so true. Yes. And turned it into his sort of like political ideology. Yes. You know, you're stronger than this. Don't be a victim. Be an example to the other girls. You just let this roll off your shoulder. And he called everybody into the back room and lined them all up, not the offender, yeah. but, you know, the, the the girls who wouldn't let me stay in the company apartment, so I had to stay in the boys' apartment. And he just went down the line and just screamed at them. And I remember them being so ashamed and it made me feel so good. Like that, you know? Right. He was like, you know, that guy's going to salute you. You know, what's wrong with you? Sort of dressing down their work ethic. And it felt good. Like I I wanted to hear that. It, it felt like he cared about me. But I mean, looking back at the scheme of things, you know, that that was that was my compensation. Yeah. That, that was all I got. Right. Yeah. And so and it's for a while it was, I mean, it wasn't enough, but it, it worked. You know, I was like, yeah, it felt good. Yes. Even though I was being so horrifically, tr- you know, mistreated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the, what it's, he hadn't done anything wrong. Yeah. Right. So, so that his impulse was to protect the other person, mm-hmm. right. Gives you a sense of his own understanding of, all of it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes, definitely. I mean, he he had to have empathized with this abuser to yes. let him keep his job. Uh, you know, if we start drawing lines that you can't jump all over uh, one of the women that work for the company, who <laughs> among us has not? Oh you know, God. that's what yes, he's basically exactly. saying. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, how on earth could he get this guy fired? That's all I wanted. I wanted him fired. He yeah. wasn't fit to be traveling. He shouldn't have been staying in apartments. He had substance abuse problems. He shouldn't be traveling with the girls. Yeah. All, all I wanted was for him to be fired, and he stayed. We, we worked together. I mean, not really, but we would. I'd walk into room. I'd do interviews in stores, and he'd be there working. I always got this sense that he had been horribly bullied and abused as a kid, 
like at school, not by parents. Yeah. And the result of what this was, he had gotten this sort of real sympathy slash like I, identification <laughs> with people who were being accused or criticized or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because I remember he, he was always, it, someone would do something horrible or screw up and people in the company would be mad at that person. And his instinct was always to defend and protect oh that my person. Gosh, absolutely. I, I was in Boston and I uncovered this scheme, I almost wrote about it in the book, where the manager was had like her family on the payroll, her boyfriend, they didn't work there. Yeah. But she was just misappropriate, just embezzling all of this money sure. from the company. And I discover it when I'm there. I like write this like email. It's like three pages long. I'm like this is going on and this is going on. Like here I am. I I'm seeing it with my own eyes and looking at the paperwork. And I got a call back from from uh, one of his gals. And she was like, that was a really long email. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but did you see what I uncovered? Sure. And she said, Dove says that she's a really nice girl. Yeah. And that was it. She kept her job. I went on to the next city. She, I mean, who knows what happened after I left, but Dove says she's a nice girl. Yeah, there was, I remember we were doing these warehouse sales because he would make all this inventory yeah. that was obviously not going to sell. Yeah, I love and those it, sales. The, the factory store. Yes. Is, oh, best. But, but uh, so much of it in retrospect was obviously just bad managerial decisions. Yeah, That's why definitely. we had this stuff. And then because he was so attached to it, mm -hmm. he could never just get rid of it, right? Yep. And so we would sell in these warehouse sales. And I remember we, I, I was doing all the marketing for them. We had these successful ones in the US, so we were gonna take it on the road. We're doing one in London and one in Paris maybe. And so this is right when Facebook started blowing up. So we the marketing just takes off at this level that we don't anticipate. So I don't know, we expected like a thousand people to come to sale, like 20,000 people RSVP to the Facebook event. Mm -hmm. So oh it, it, it's taken yeah. off on this level, that right? <laughs> yeah. And so I'm like, talking to the people who are doing the thing and one of one of his sort of you know there's the dove girls but they're also dove boys they were like mm -hmm. guys who oh, you couldn't figure out what their role in the universe mm -hmm. was and one of them was in charge of it and i, and I remember going twenty thousand people or more are going to show up this thing you have to be prepared for that there's going to need to be security and we went over mm -hmm. it like multiple times mm -hmm. and he just sort of eh, you know like mm -hmm. just flying with cedar fans and so what happens is twenty thousand people show up the store can't, it's not ready to open, yeah. and a riot breaks out. Oh and like God. 20 police officers were injured in this riot. Oh There's gosh. videos of it, like people jumping on police cars. It, crazy. <laughs> so this is all obviously happening in the middle of the night, but yeah. I'm sort of watching it happen. And, um, you know, I call Dove, it's like four in the morning. And uh, I go, Dove. And he, and he's the first, uh, he, he obviously had already heard about it. And the first words out of his mouth were, it's not insert's fault. Like not like, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna help these people? I can't believe it, yes. blah, blah, blah. It was, it's not this person's fault. And it obviously wasn't a sexual thing because it's a dude yeah. and- and Like what's the important issue here? The important <sighs> issue is is not holding a person accountable. Yes. That was the thing. And so there was, I think again, because if people start getting, if we start holding people accountable for stuff, then the we, whole thing falls apart. You're so, so that's so true. Yeah. I, yeah, you can see it again and again. Yeah. And so you're like, this isn't a business. This is like somebody's Freudian, yes. like whatever, just a plan. Yes. Out, you know? Yes. And then I just kept working. Yeah. Yeah. And then you just stay. <laughs> um, yeah. That's the weirdest. That's the weird. Like, how did I think it was going to go? Where did I think it was going to go? Yeah. And then I remember at the end, like, part of me going, like, um, but now I'm not gonna be able to say that I worked like like I remember thinking like this time would be good because the company was obviously gonna go on and it would be like, oh, I worked at Apple in you know the early days. Yeah, the early days, yeah. But how did I not I guess I just didn't have the ability to go, this is obviously crashing and burning at some point. Yeah. Like you're you're trading <clears throat> yeah, you're trading your values for an item on your resume. Putting aside that you don't want a resume, you want to work for yourself, mm -hmm. but you're for this line item on your resume as if it's not inevitably going to blow itself up. Yeah, absolutely. Did you find when you left when you tried to work, people were like, they saw, they actually saw it as like a not a an asset but a liability. Oh, it was totally. There? Yeah, I talk about it in striptease. You know, I was like, I'm going to get a new job. 
Yeah. I'm going to, you know, who's not going to want me? I did all the hiring for the biggest company, American Apparel. Who's not going to want me? No one wanted me. They, they were like, because they, they knew I had a bad reputation just by default. They were, they wanted to talk. I, I applied to Betsy Johnson. They wanted to talk about Dove Charney. Yeah. What was it like there? You know, to them, I was just sort of like a curiosity. I was an oddity. I was a young person with no other job experience. And I'm sure they just all assumed I was one of his girlfriends. I've had this weird experience. There was Dove and there's another one where basically like when I was young, this sort of successful older man saw potential in me mm -hmm. and gave me a position or access that I almost certainly didn't deserve. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought it was very exciting and interesting and I learned a lot and obviously it set me up to be successful. But as I've left, I've had to, I've, I've wrestled with this idea of like, were they wrong or were they right? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like. It's obviously this corrupt, fucked up system that's just like picking people that it thinks can be kind of willing soldiers in this mm -hmm. yeah. thing. But then also you did a great job. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you, they were getting a great bargain on you. They were yeah. paying you a little and you were actually super competent. Mm -hmm. But I, I think I, I've struggled with this idea of like, did they actually see something in me? Or was it like a... a, a the broken system is right occasionally? Yeah. You know, did, or... Did they see that I was talented, but I also had this other thing that mm -hmm. they could take advantage of? Yeah. Like, I, I've really struggled. I, of all the things I should be, you know, sorting through, like, what does this say about me? It's probably mm -hmm. not the main thing I should be thinking about yeah. post-American Apparel. But that is one of the big well, ones. Yeah, like, no, what did course. it say about me? Yeah, I mean, it's such a, it's so character defining. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I just give myself a little bit of compassion mm. and grace. I I was so young sure. wrapped up in this. And you know, maybe I will have some breakdown in 10 years and be like, oh, I fed all those girls to him. Um and you know, uh, you know, I do think about that. But um I don't know. I I let myself off the hook a little bit. Yeah. Because I sense. was one of them. I was, you know, sure. sucked into that system like just so easily. Yeah. I I went back and I asked like some of the women that worked for me there. I was like was I feeding you to this yeah. thing? Like, yeah. were, did you feel like, and 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 I like, because this is when I was writing the afterward to Curtis Calling, and I was really like, I was really worried about, mm -hmm. like, there's a reason I hadn't asked yeah. the question before, you know? Like, was I part of, of the problem, right? Of course. Because I, I read about, like, I read about Harvey Weinstein and these other sort of Me Too people, mm -hmm. and I was really struck by the role of the, um, like, the secretaries yeah. or the talent agents that mm -hmm. were sending these people yes. to these auditions oh or gosh, buzzing yes. them up, right? And I, I and um, two of them that worked for me, they were like, they were like, look, I don't know about everything else, but they were like, we came from Canada to come work at American Barrel, and Dove, Dove had seen us on a trip, and he brought us down, and uh, he assigned us to work for you. And I, they were like, we remember you You didn't want us to work for you because you just thought, you yeah. know, who are these people? And mm -hmm. and and um, and uh, and then he had us staying at the house. And um, they said the first, the, they were like, what we remember is you, we came into your office first day. And did you work at the factory? Yeah, I had an office on the factory oh, on the okay. second floor, right mm -hmm. next to uh, Roz's office, as mm -hmm. you're calling yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, down, down the way a little bit. But they were like, the first thing you said to us was, you got to get the fuck out of Dove's house. And they were like, we're so grateful. And I like, I had no recollection of oh, that. Wow. That's right? so interesting. Yeah. That, that I like, I was like, okay, there's two paths here. You yes. got to get off this path. Yes. And so I felt good about that. Yeah. And, and then they? I, yes, they did. And they, they worked for me for four or five years. And they were part of the reason that I didn't leave mm -hmm. is that like, I knew that I I could go, you gotta give this person a raise. Or like I could I was the intermediary yeah, between sure. them. Because there wasn't yes. a lot of hierarchy, right? No, not at all. And there was at least some respected hierarchy there, which meant more that I could act as a buffer, not even just from Dove, but mm -hmm. the other crazy, awful people. Mm -hmm. um, oh my gosh, yeah. And and yes. so I felt good about that. But then it's still it's I don't know, I've st I still wrestle with the I by not by not speaking up, how complicit are you? Mm -hmm. And then also, though, the reason I was able to work on his removal ultimately is that I was still there. So there's it's yeah. this inherently yes. problematic position of being the adult in the room. Mm -hmm. Is the adult in the room 
a positive influence or actually a stamp of approval. Yeah. Yeah. And if you weren't there doing that gig, who else could be doing it? You know, when I did my hiring after this experience, you know, well, really, I I, I wouldn't hire high schoolers. Sure. In the beginning, I did. Oh. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but then just because, you know, they just, yeah. I was, I wanted full timers. Sure. I wanted people who wanted the health insurance. Um, you know, I went out and, and, and hired, you know, people in their mid twenties, people that, you know, had been working at Urban Outfitters and now they could have their own store. Sure. Um, and like, there was a lot of good in that. These yeah. girls learned how to create businesses and sell businesses mm -hmm. and what other jobs would be giving people someone like me an opportunity like that. You know, yes. I learned so much about how businesses run and so did all the other girls. In fact, my editor was like, that's how we should have ended this book. Just a list of where everybody is now, like to really fuck with people. I don't like this ending. Uh, you know, people want like a didactic wrap up. Yeah. They want me to say like, mm -hmm. sexism is bad and I was bad. And, but that's like just too easy of an ending for this story. You know, why, yeah. do, why do these stories keep happening? You know, at the end of my book, I have like a sort of dark joke where I'm going into TV to work for a man called Les Moonves. And isn't he going to be great? Because yeah, he's a good family man yeah. and has a good reputation. Yeah. 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 You know, these stories, it's not just the American Apparel story. Dove is not just this, you know, isolated offender. Sure. Um, and, you know, it's not all bad. A lot of good things came from this company. It taught us a lot of things. It taught me a lot about myself. And um, yeah. Do you do you see, did did a bunch of people that you hired go on to do things? Um, not people that I hired, because, you know, I sort of lose touch yeah. with them. I you yeah. know, hire a staff and leave. But the, the women that worked with me, uh, yes. Sure. Yeah, a lot of the women in the book. I, think that's I mean, a even Roz. I mean, look at Roz. Like they go you... on to create their own uh, apparel companies that are wildly successful. Yeah, I, I've always, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't have had the guts. I wouldn't I, have known I could do it. I had a different read on American Apparel. I thought it was remarkable that a company that was so big and so influential actually didn't have, it didn't seed like a bunch of other big companies. Yeah. Like yeah. they're one of, well, funny enough, one of the store designers is the co-founder of WeWork. Oh, no, no way. <laughs> yeah. Um, store designer for? Like for the New York stores. He would. He was oh one of the, God. like one of the, idea. like architect, like build out guys. Yeah, yeah. Miguel something, I think is his name. Oh, yeah. Um, and then there's a, there's a couple other ones, but not, you would yeah. think that when something falls, that talent would go elsewhere. Yeah. I'm, I've, I've always wondered how much of it in retrospect was talent if it didn't yeah. go on to do other things. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking more, I mean, maybe they're not huge companies, but uh, one of the girls I write about in the book, you know, she went on to just become an entrepreneur. Yeah. She'll start, she had a little business selling like the rubber bands that go on braces. That's and right. she was like, I would go to these like orthodontic fairs and I would, I would merchandise them just like American Apparel. I had right. every color. And she was sure. like, I made so much money. and It was all under the table that I had to stop doing it. So wow. then she took the money share in there and she bought a huge piece of land, which she's going to turn into a subdivision. Like, sure. she would never, this is someone who doesn't have a college education. Yeah, like, she right. learned everything in American Apparel. You know, look what she's done. It's it's so amazing. She's so angry at me, but I really respect her as, as oh, an Oh, because of how she came off in the book, she's angry? Uh, no, no, oh, no. Oh, because sorry. of Dove's reaction to the book. She actually loved the book at first. She posted it on her story. Hey, everybody, I'm in this book. And then the next day, she went to Dove's factory. And then the next morning, I got a text being like, my feelings have changed. I feel exploited. I can't believe you didn't tell me you were gonna tell my stories. So um, it, that's the power of dub, even now. Well, I want to ask about that in a second, but yeah, I I, uh, I I feel like I learned a bunch of lessons like that. Even well, one from your book, I like the thing where he was like, "You're at some store," and he's like, "See this tile?" Oh yeah. And he's like, "Do you know what that's the so rent dumb. is on this tile?" Mm -hmm. That's a and he says for people who haven't read it yet, he goes, "Look at this tile." What do you think the rent on this piece of tile is? Basically saying like, I have to sell two t-shirts a day to pay for this tile. this tile. And he's like, look how many fucking pieces of tile are in this store. Mm -hmm. Now, one argument is you were the one that put in this expensive tile. And <laughs> you know you didn't think any of that through, Dove. But the other is, yeah, you have to think about the cost of uh, just break even cost. Mm -hmm. I remember one time we were, we were, we just opened a new store, just started some different channel and, um, you know, he said something and um, he goes, or, you know, he said something and I go, eh, like the, the sales are like, you know, a thousand dollars or whatever. He goes, Ryan, he's like, run rates always start at zero. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, I realized that he was a person who had started at zero and built that to mm-hmm. seven, eight hundred million dollars a year in sales. Like he and he yep. saw that with each store. It starts with the first day has zero dollars in sales, and the next day it's a hundred and two hundred. And so mm-hmm. he had this ability to kind of extrapolate where he had this confidence in himself because he knew where stuff ended up, right? Yes. And he's that run rates always start at zero. Yeah. Something I think about all the time whenever I'm starting something new. Yes. Like I'm launching a book. I go, the first week. Mm-hmm. starting at zero. Mm-hmm. But what matters is where it ends up. It doesn't matter how it's doing right now. Yeah. Right? It doesn't even yes. matter what the run rate says. It matters where it ends up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's responsible for putting those blinders on him. Yes. The only experience success. I had another one where he, um, some like I called him to like tell him something good I'd done. And uh, like, we just did this. And he goes, Brian, never call me to tell me you did your fucking job. <laughs> Oh my God, totally. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, that's right. This is literally what I'm supposed to be doing. Why Why am I, you're not my dad. Why am I trying to get some pat on the back from you? Yeah, um, Yeah, but oh God, I lived for those pats on the back. Of course, mm-hmm. of course, that's the whole system. Yeah. So what was his reaction to the book? Um, or have you heard? I haven't heard. Well, I mean, we, he doesn't read books, so there's that, no way he true. read this book. Yeah. So I think my friend went there and gave him the lowdown. Mm-hmm. And he got angry. Yes. Um, not that there's anything in this book that hasn't really been said or done in front of a journalist. There are a few scoops in there yeah. um, um, that I'm sure he wasn't too psyched on. Um, and I've been waiting in the reviews or pieces on the book for that, you know, we reached out to Dub Charney yeah. for comment. And it finally happened in a Washington Post piece. And it said, you know, we reached out for comment and, you know, he didn't comment. Yeah. Um, and then recently I had a reading where um, there was a young woman who works for him who came and she, you know, at the end, I, I think she's even still living in the big house. Yeesh. I know with all that stuff happening. Yeah, and not um, for much longer, it sounds like. Yeah, I know. I know. Oh, God, it's so fascinating. I, it's so strange, that story. Um, she, uh, you know, I, I asked her, what does he think? And yeah. she was sort of like, oh, you know, I, I knew there was an opinion um, but she wouldn't give it to me. Yeah. But she said, um, you know, I talk a lot about the sort of the complicated nature of Dove when I do these Q&As. And, uh, you know, it's hard to just totally disavow my experience there and and, and be critical of of him and him as a businessman and stuff like that. And she, of course, loved that. Yeah. You know, I think people want me to be like, he's bad, he's, sure. awful, he's a predator. There's just such a difference between predators like Weinstein and, and predators like Charney. Um, and then the next day she wrote to me and was like, I just, I just want to tell you again how much I liked how you handled yourself in that Q and A. So I, I really don't know how he feels about it. Other Do you than, think he sent that person? Yeah. So that doesn't read to you as like intimidation? I it didn't intimidate me. But I mean, do you, like one, one, if you're, if, if yeah. you're not, if, Gosh, if I shouldn't think about that, like I'm trying to think about how a, a person who if you're this is a Scientology story or a different thing you'd be like oh they sent they sent representatives well in the audience to send a message yes well there could be other representatives that he could send that would intimidate me people that are in this story who are still with him and that was always sort of my fear like Mm. what if they show up what if they're yelling yeah my lawyer's like you want that to happen it's good for the book bring them on (laughs) you know um but yeah I, i that's so interesting it could be. It could be an intimidation tactic. Yeah, he's just sort of, I don't know, keeping his hands on the pulse. But I yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to know what he thinks about it, but I have no idea. Yeah, I never, I've never heard from him about anything that I've oh, yeah. written. I always thought it would be fascinating for there to be a documentary about it. But Well, do you know about this Netflix documentary? No. Uh, it's greenlit. Oh. Yeah, I thought for sure they would be talking to you about it. Well, so at a certain point, I just decided... I don't owe anyone interviews about mm-hmm. my experience at American Apparel. Yeah. Because like I did one, it was some, he was on that podcast startup. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. That. That was a good one. And it, I did like five hours of interviews for it. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was interesting. It was cathartic. It was yeah. actually a great episode. And, and they really got some stuff. Like they got him like losing his mind. Renting and raving. Yeah, that yeah. was a good one. That might be the one where the, uh, the girl and her partner are fighting. That was, that was a good representation of. Although there were some mm-hmm. people in there that I was like, you're a nobody. You did not do anything. <laughs> yeah. But, all this, I basically was like, I, I have to move on and live my life. I don't, Absolutely. I don't owe anyone like a part time job. Like yeah. a part time job 
you know, as a spokes as an a spokesperson yes. for ex employees. And so I just basically yes. decided I turned down all of them. Mm-hmm. I don't do them. Yeah. And it's been sort of healing and yeah, and also good. like cleared up time. Yeah. And, and then every once in a while, there's one I go, oh, I should, I maybe I should have done that one, but yeah. Um, it's just because every like I'm glad we're doing this, but every mm-hmm. time I see someone from American Apparel, I'm like. Yeah. I could spend like eight hours because yes. there's just so much so to much, process. So much. Yeah, so much to process. Yeah, and you realize you're just carrying it around. Mm-hmm. And uh, so yeah. anyways, that's kind of my thing. But yeah, yeah I'd be fascinated. I th- there, yeah. there should be a a really good documentary about yeah. it. Yeah, I think this might be good. It's by um, this production company, Raw. They did like The Tinder Swindler and Don't Fuck mm. With Cats. Um, I mean... It, if I didn't have this book, I would never want to do something yeah. like that. I'm like a yeah. very private person. Sure. You know, I just put out this memoir spilling my guts, but I really am. Like, yeah. uh, it's so hard to do like the social media thing for this book. Like, mm-hmm. I really don't like that. Um, but now I've got to promote this book. So yeah, I'm sure. like, damn, I got to be on that Netflix documentary. I met with them. And then, of course, in the selling of the option, it just precludes me from oh, doing anything like right. that. So, you know, it's so hard to get a movie made. You know, I'll be so incredibly lucky if it happens. And here's this green lit documentary sure. that would be sure. so good for my book, but I can't do it. But I think... I. I mean, the thing with these documentaries, though, is the people that you really want to hear from yeah. would never in a million years. Right. They're going to do it when they're like 70. <laughs> They'll still be with it when they're 70. Which is so tragically sad. I know. Yeah, what I is mean, that? it's been 20 years, you know. So what is that? Why Why can't certain people get away? What? Because I think that's yeah. like you see it happen in other facets of life where you're like, this person has taken everything from you. Yeah. Like humiliated you. Yeah. Like you have not gotten a good end of this bargain and you're still. Yeah. He sniffs out vulnerable people. And I, it's, I don't think it's something he does on purpose. We were right. talking about Michael Jackson, yeah. you know, my sister who's a psychologist, she was like, how did Michael Jackson know to, you know, snow the parents? And like, how was he such a skilled manipulator? Like, it's mm. not something you learn. It's just like this innate thing in you and that's dub uh you know he's so charismatic he's a very complex predator because he's not a violent you know i'm gonna drug your drink predator but does he you know he still has those tools within him i mean he still somehow manages to pick these vulnerable people that will stay with him this long yeah that was uh, understanding that that trauma the way trauma can affect a person like i, I remember i read something that sort of changed they were like if you grew up watching your your dad beat your mom right you're not just seeing this is how men treat women Mm -hmm. but you're you're seeing or even inheriting whatever it is Mm -hmm. that makes a woman attracted to a person that does that to yes so you're actually getting it from both sides like we Mm -hmm. think it's like oh it's just the the person doing the overt act that's the problem Mm -hmm. but actually it's both right you're getting it both and so yeah, there must be just some profound codependency in some oh, of these definitely. folks that make you go. Because again, when the person's on the top of the world, there's an economic logic to mm-hmm. it. There's a fun, sexy, yes. good energy to yes. to want to be in the bunker with this person. Yeah, absolutely. Like who marries Kanye West now? Yes. You know, like that's it's that. It's yes. that energy. Or even Dove. I mean, Dove's like, now I want to be in the Kanye West business. Yes. And you're like, oh, that's because when one tribe kicks you out mm-hmm. to like it's like if the if the the trendy cool uh tribe kicks you out and then there's the the deplorables over mm-hmm. here you know you'd think you'd you'd be able to exist here because that's bad mm-hmm. but it's actually you can't be in the limbo you, you so you end up being driven into the arms of the other people yes. who who your objections to fall away pretty quickly because they Mm-hmm. like you and you have a shared enemy which is these yes. people yes no absolutely um one of the girls in my book carolee we were talking before she, before she read the book and became angry with me um she was like you know i don't feel um victimized by dove i feel more victimized by people like Roz, who used me you know she took a lot of those photos you know who sort of used me mm. to impress dove yeah and she said you know what dove and i had was something special I was just like knocked over. Wow. Like 20 years later, she's saying this. You guys had something special. You and hundreds of girls, but you had something special. And that's his skill. Yeah. You know, every girl feels like that. And that's why there, some of them, a lot of them are still with him. He makes them feel special. He makes, he, I mean, he made me feel special. I'm sure he made you feel special. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, very much so. Very good at that. Yeah. I, and I've, I've had to do work on my own child because my, my sister works for someone nowhere like Dove, mm-hmm. but like, 
on a spectrum of that kind of leader. Yeah, a, lot of, is a lot of corporate culture is like that, yeah. certainly in reality television. And, and my aunt was like, what do you think that is? You know, And I'd mm-hmm. never thought about yeah. it. And it was in, it's, yeah, it's interesting to go, oh yeah, so w- there must be some, what are you doing, dad? You know, like like there's some energy <laughs> like yeah. uh, that, that makes you go, I need this person's approval or mm-hmm. I need them to see me or I need to be part of that inner circle, inner sanctum or whatever. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There was another one maybe you might like this. I, I remember one time. Did you get called into these like meetings, which weren't really meetings? They were just like two hours of With ranting. Him ranting. And yeah, I was just going to say a ranting meeting. Absolutely. Yeah. So it, uh, I, I would often get called to the ones at the, on the seventh floor of the factory. Mm-hmm. And I remember we, it's like, it would, it'd be like, you'd be walking and talking and then you're in there and then you'd be like, go get this person and go get this. And it was like, suddenly <laughs> oh, you realize I'm like, getting flashbacks. The, the, the whole company has been called in, right? And so I, I remember it struck me one time, like nobody's working because everyone's, because everyone's here. here. Yes. And I said to one of the other creative directors, not Roz, mm-hmm. and I said, um, you know, what was that? You know, and mm-hmm. she goes, the thing about Dove is he wants an audience a little bit more than he wants to be successful. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, for him, again, wow. the company was the accidental byproduct of mm-hmm. wanting the people who have to yes. listen to him, yes. you know? Uh, just like, again, yeah, like the person, the political career is the byproduct of wanting to be chosen yes. or wanting to be the the person with their finger on the button, right? Yeah. And, and, and yeah, just going, oh yeah, for him, it's this desire to perform, to be the center of attention, mm-hmm. to be attended to yeah. that everything else is the by and so try yeah. just walking to, around in his underwear like perfect yeah. symptom of that like yeah yeah so it's in, the show but what i've tried to do especially as i've gotten older is go like my job is not to make a character study of this person but to go what in this person is similar to something in myself mm-hmm. like where do i have things where what i really like to do is be angry more than i'd like to solve the problem yeah. or you know what i mean like yes. where do i have those tendencies and then how do i chip away at them that's pretty good yeah maybe i should start doing that <laughs> i know i feel like you did it in a, you did a good job in the book i yeah. thought you you um especially for a thing that i think you could e- very easily for your experience just be like in my 20s i worked at this place that was it you know what mm-hmm. i mean like like is it it's it's it wasn't like it i mean i guess you had the business cards but you weren't like uh it was your identity to the world like no one mm-hmm. would have to know Mm-hmm. Right. But for clearly, you decided to go back and think about what it meant, what parts of you it triggered, what, you know, I, which is what memoir is, yeah, right? It's like sure. action. The, the event, it, it doesn't have to be actually an action packed, crazy story filled with hijinks. It, it's really what does it mean to you? And then by understanding what it means to you, what does the reader learn about themselves? Yeah, definitely. Yes. I think when people finish this book with a judgment, how could you? Yeah. Uh, it says more about them than it does about me because this book is how anyone can be sucked into that. You know, here here's the gymnastics that sure. I went through. It wasn't it wasn't a, a a character flaw. It was, you know, how someone can get sucked into a, a cult, an abusive relationship and, and stay and yeah. stay for a long time. Yeah. How does your conscience get chipped away at by yeah. your work or your identity or yes. your tribe or whatever? Yes. How can you become debased without realizing it? How yes. can things just warp before your very eyes? Well, yeah, that's the line in the thing. How do you, you, you fool yourself into thinking you can deal in filth and not mm-hmm. become filthy? Yes. Yes. But you can't. You can't. You can't. Yeah. It's the, so true. The, there's an expression I heard, like the things you work on work on you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. and, you know, and, and ultimately oh gosh, you're being yeah. changed by it as you're doing mm-hmm. it, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I got obviously my, because my first book was not really a memoir of American Apparel. It was more mm-hmm. like what it meant about the media and that time yeah. and place. Your, that book helped sell my book. I oh, had that really? right at the top of my proposal. I was like, Brian Holiday, pitch this book about working for American Apparel. Look how everyone responded. Well, let me tell you, I have that book. Yeah, no, nobody. My uh, agent was like, put that at the very top. That's going at the top. It's, it's funny because, uh, when that came out, everyone was just super mad at me. Like they were like, like I was, you know, like that there was this, it felt like a lot of shooting the messenger. And I remember going in at some point like, you know, I didn't have to write this book. Mm-hmm. Like, like mm-hmm. 
I could have just kept doing it. Like, so this idea that this is like good for me, I don't think you understand yes. how this works. Like, yeah. and for you, for people, like you could have just kept working there. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. and, and you could still be working there now. Like mm -hmm. some of these people who basically have mm -hmm. sort of jobs for life. Yes, um, they, their lives are their jobs. Yeah, but, but you're, I chose not to for a reason. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying mm -hmm. I don't have things that I regret or feel ashamed of that yeah, or things of that like I don't have to answer for. But I'm only answering for them because I told you I did them. Yeah, you know, that's very like true. like uh, <laughs> it it didn't have to go this way. Yeah, you did so not. True. I was like, especially that really upset me with the media stuff. It's like you could have found this stuff out, but mm -hmm. you didn't mm -hmm. because for your own reasons, you didn't want to know certain things or it was hard for you to know some things. Yes. So you rather just talk about what the ads mean or what they represent, yes. Yes. right? And I really hated that thing where they would go, she uh, she looks barely legal. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, so first off, the phrase barely legal means legal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And second, now you're saying it doesn't even, it, you're saying, you're double confirming that this thing is legal. You're just saying you don't like it is what you're saying. Yes. You're saying it's it's weird. Which it is, but there's a difference between weird and what you're implying. Mm -hmm. But but like that's not the issue, as you say in the book. Like mm -hmm. the issue is is that that is an actual person, and that the 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 photo yes. is capturing what happened before the things that you should be upset about happened. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, actually, it might not even be a sexual thing that happened. What mm -hmm. actually happened is that you have. A mm -hmm. person making eleven out eleven dollars an hour, working mm -hmm. ninety hours a week. Yes, you know, um, you know what? Like you, what you think is happening is not what's happening. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's not the issue here. It's, I mean, it's an issue, but it's not the big issue. So the the other thing I've wrestled with, and we can wrap up. But I've what was always hard for me. So I my job was doing public relations for a person who was <sighs> yeah. guilty of stuff. But the tricky part is, and I'm sure you saw some of this, and this, this isn't a thing that our culture has the ability to handle, especially in a world where we have to say things like believe women because women are often not believed. Mm -hmm. But some of these people are problematic. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And so, like, ultimately, the lawyer who filed most of the lawsuits against Dove ultimately represented him, him. Yeah. in the lawsuit yes. where, against the board where he argued that Dove was innocent of all the things, right? So though one of those has to not be true. Mm -hmm. And also that same lawyer and one of his clients, when I was 20 years old, 21 years old, broke into my email and leaked all of it. Oh my God. Like there's a police, there's a whole thing. So like I had this sense of, and I think this allowed me to see what I, to not see what I needed to see was that- Because it's so horrifying. Do you know what I mean? These were, <laughs> these were complicated things. Yes. It wasn't as clear cut as and you're, person did X, Yeah. they deserve Y. And you're 23 when this is happening, when your emails are late. Yeah, probably, yeah, pro oh, yeah, must have been, it was like 2008 maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I thought my whole oh, life no, was over. Than that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can't imagine how dramatic that must have been. Um, which I mean, it, it was my fault in some ways, but whatever. But the the point is, this wasn't. This isn't. This wasn't Aaron Brockovich mm -hmm. shit. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like this was, this was yeah. complicated, and yes. that's made it hard for me as I've left to go. Like, should I? You know, how have you thought about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, like I said, I sort of let myself off the hook a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, I just really feel like he is the one responsible mm. and I am a victim too. I may yeah. not have been sleeping with him, um, but I, you know, I like haplessly got sucked in. Yeah. Is that what you mean? No, no. I, I, yeah, I do. But I mean, also as we wrestle societally with Me Too and- mm -hmm. Predator, et cetera. Yeah. What you see it, what you saw firsthand in American Apparel is that it was complicated. Oh, right? Yeah. Like, like oh, that, absolutely. Like it was like some of the stuff he got in trouble with was for was actually like was unfair. And then the things that he didn't get in trouble for actually were wrong. Yes, and I, I see think what you mean. that's yes. what fucked with my compass the most. Is yeah. it's like 
I happen to know in this instance, mm -hmm. I've met you and I was there. Yeah. And then in this instance, I saw this other thing and what the fuck was that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And those those were separated in some cases by years. Yes. And so. Yeah. See, you worked with him more than I did. You know, he was almost like a, you know, a larger than life sort of cartoon character to yeah. me. So I, you know, mm. I did see certain dichotomies, but uh, when I thought about him, I just sort of idealized him as this sort of um, like funny, um, you know, boss that was like me, who wasn't really like a boss, not like any boss I had had before. Yeah, but then like me and girls, I'm not like a mom, I'm like yeah, a cool he's, mom. Yeah, he's the cool <laughs> boss for sure. <laughs> Yeah. I was just totally in drinking all the Kool-Aid. Right. Uh, you know, it had to take some really dark stuff for me to, yeah. to uh, realize there's like really bad stuff happening here. I and think, I stayed. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> I refrain. For me, that was actually one of the kind of the breaking points was going, I believed you on these other ones. Yeah. And then it kept happening. So even if it's complicated. You are continually putting yourself in the situations, which is unfair to everyone who works yes, here. Yes, yes. You know, like even if this is 20% exaggerated, 50 even if it's wholly made up, mm -hmm. you know, there's one way to solve this. Yeah. And you can't do that thing. Mm -hmm. And so for you to circle the wagons and say, let's all protect the thing, it's like actually you're the one that is repeatedly jeopardizing yes which is its own sick logic though i've seen people say this about trump you know they're like they're like i believe in what trump stands for yeah. <laughs> the problem is he he's not art uh, like artful enough about it and mm -hmm. it's like i get it because it's like you're a true believer and you think he's the problem because he's jeopardizing where well, you haven't gotten to the places you go this stuff is fucked up yes this <laughs> is the wrong stuff <laughs> yes. it's bad yes <laughs> yeah totally that is a really yeah that makes sense um yeah, and that that he just kept doing it. it is again. It's like even you don't get falsely accused fifty times no. or something. No, definitely not. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that that's the that's the other thing because I wrote the book about media manipulation. I have heard from basically in in the intervening 10, 11 years, I've heard from pretty much everyone that's ever been canceled or mm -hmm. like accused of something mm -hmm. like against my will in most cases yeah. like someone gives them the book and then they reach out and it's oh, it, you know what i mean and, and and like Look in some cases you. like people i find like totally abhorrent yes and then and then it, it it was it's like being this defense lawyer that with time you go could all my clients be innocent that doesn't work you know and <laughs> yeah. going like yeah. how are you Mm -hmm. And you're all saying the same fucking shit, which is not just like, I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. You're like, I didn't do it. And I'm really the victim. Mm -hmm. But because they only say that to usually to someone who hasn't heard it before. Yeah. It makes sense, right? Yes. I yes. got to imagine like someone who's a domestic abuse survivor, the second husband mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. the excuses don't work as well. It's yeah. with the first, it's when you're in the the back and forth with the first person mm -hmm. that you don't see how transparently the playbook is being run mm -hmm. on. You know yeah, what I that's mean? that's true. Mm -hmm. So what's the next book? Um, the next book is, well, I haven't sold it yet. I'm kind of, yeah, I still, I work full time. My life is really I busy. I wrote my first three books while I was at American Apparel. So. Yeah, yeah. It's, I know that very well. Yeah. In fact, if I didn't, it would probably be more difficult for me because I sort of need that structure. Keeps you honest. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, it's a book, let's see, it's, um, it's Virgin Suicides meets, uh, you know, that documentary Paradise Lost about the West Memphis Three? Yeah. The three, it's, so that's what it is. Okay. Virgin Suicides in the Satanic Panic Era. Oh. And, um, it's a book about corruption and, um, a rumor panic that sweeps this small town that's sort of living in fear already of brown people moving in from Philly and and, and true joblessness. Story? Yeah, true story. Wow. True story. It takes place in uh, 1996, the events. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Good it's, for you. it's a very character defining story for me. And in a way, it really shows how I uh, I could get sucked into this to this uh, yeah. striptease. It's a good it's a good prequel. No, good for you. I mean, that's kind of the playbook I did, which is like I wanted to be a writer. And I knew I had to write about this thing that I'd experienced. Yeah. And I knew I, it can't be later. Like it has to, you have to yeah. get it out. Yeah. That, you know what I mean? And I think you did it yeah. like, this is, this is 
burning the boats behind you. Yeah, and sure. now you can write about something that you're interested in that that yeah. is, you know, and you've proven it, you've proven that you can write a book, prove a book that gets reviewed well, that mm -hmm. sells well. You've done all that stuff. Yeah. And now, now you're gonna be like, now one for you, yeah, one for me. My passion project. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Anything we missed, you think? Mm, there, uh, in the beginning, you asked me uh, when I started, how I started to write the book. Yes. And it's interesting, uh, right after I left, because the story was still, I mean, I just knew I would write about these crazy events. Yeah. I started to write a fictionalized version. Uh -huh. And I got about 75 pages in. And um, then I just sort of lost steam. You know, the company was still, this is in 2009, 2010, yeah. I was doing this. And the company yeah. was still raring to go. And I sort of just didn't have any perspective. And it really took uh, the Me Too movement happening yeah. and just reflection and me, you know, doing something else for a decade. And I always knew it really probably should be a true story because yeah. you, you don't need to make this shit up. It's just tell well, tell like it is. Anytime, like when they did him on SNL, mm -hmm. there's like a Law and Order episode about, they're yeah. so bad. It, it yeah. can't, it's so um, unbelievable yes. that it only, it, you can basically only do it as real. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I don't think it, I don't think it would have worked. No, as a novel. I don't think so either. And some agents were like, "We, you should do that." I, you know, the people. It was meant to be a true story, and I'm glad I did it now, um, when I've really had time to think. It's also just such an interesting period culturally that like is just distant enough, but mm -hmm. doesn't quite feel like it's not far enough. That there's nostalgia, mm -hmm. but just yeah, how many bands were coming out then? Like yeah. the the hipster thing is now in the rear view like there's no yep. like hipster it's because it, the trend lasted a long time but like mm -hmm. it's kind of brooklyn feels over yeah east la feels over mm -hmm. like it's it's now a historical yeah. period yeah. as opposed to a thing that mm -hmm. like now when i say like it used to be it'd be like i was the director of marketing in america and people would know what that was oh yeah and now i, I don't even put it in my bio yeah. not because like i'm ashamed of it but it just doesn't mean anything yeah it's it like, doesn't mean anything it's like oh he was the ceo of compact computer yeah. people are like what <laughs> you know like it, it, it the word doesn't even have any rest which yes. to me is the saddest most tragic part like it to is. have something so popular and so big and so ubiquitous yes just and so much potential for changing an industry. Yeah. Like, am I deluded? I still think we can do it again. I mean, maybe not Dove Charney. Well, I think a lot of people can take, like, I try to run my business. Like, I only make stuff in the U.S. I try to, like, yeah. I've taken a lot of those principles and how I do it, mm -hmm. which he was right about. Yes. And I think post the pandemic and then the supply chain crisis, yeah. we are seeing a lot of reshoring. People are like, oh, yeah, it's not free mm -hmm. to make your stuff. 3,000 miles yes. away, 5,000 miles away, or whatever. I like a 12 year old in Bangladesh, you know? I remember he said to me once, he was like, You can't buy a bikini for $5 without mm -hmm. somebody getting fucked. Yes. <laughs> yes. And like, it's true. Like, it doesn't mm -hmm. have, you can't make an item of clothing for 80 cents. No. It's like, it's just not yeah. how it works. I know. And by the way, American Press stuff wasn't any more expensive than the other shit. So where does that money, where was that money going for the other brands? Yes. You know, it was yep. going to the models and the celebrities and the mm -hmm. Times Square store and a mm -hmm. bunch of other waste, basically. Yeah. No. Yeah. And then then I was like, I was like, am I going to read it? Am I not going to read it? And then I was like, I read it and I was like, really, I read it in a day. I thought it was amazing. Oh, thank you. Thanks of course. So